very good morning to you uh, joining us for this uh, 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 seminar uh, in the seminar series, um, which is on uh, designing teaching and study spaces to support uh, educational uh, change. And I'm really delighted to welcome participants really from all over Europe and indeed all over the world. Delighted to have also um, quite a number of um, participants from, from Africa um, here with us today. Um, just a couple, so my name is Jan Pomowski, I'm the Secretary General uh, of the Guild. Um, and before I pass the word on to, to uh, Moira Fischbacher-Smith, who will lead us through the, the webinar today, um, I just wanted to say that uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, rules. So um, uh, please, um, it's it's really important that this uh, webinar is interactive. So if you have um, uh, questions, please um, use the question answers function here on, in the Zoom function. Uh, and if you have any comments, please um, com uh, use the chat function for this. And please also use Twitter um, with the hashtag future of education. Um, to so that we can really ensure that that um, this is a, a, a lively discussion uh, throughout uh, the morning and afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we had uh, and dear colleagues, we uh, launched uh, last June a, um, a, a, a an insight paper from the Guild that was really authored by uh, Professor Joanne Guri, but that really had input from. Um, our member universities, and that was also supported by a writing team um, composed of uh, Berit Eicher, Arne Valk, and Karen Amos. Um, and the paper was entitled Reimagining Research-Led Education in the Digital Age. And it was really trying to reflect on this moment of uh, transformation when suddenly the world was fully digital owing to the pandemic to really think through what this meant um, uh, for the future. So how would education and pedagogy need to change and reflect uh, this moment in the future? And we um, issued a number of series, uh, a number of uh, recommendations, including uh, that the future of education is not and must not be all digital. Um, that um, research intensive uh, um, universities must leave their very distinctive strengths to lifelong uh, learning, um, taking into account really very rapidly changing working environments uh, in the world of work. Um, we um, emphasize the need to create re flexible regulatory frameworks. Um, and we really insisted that um, it internationalization was more important than ever ever in higher education especially at a time you know reflecting on the pandemic when we were retreating back into our national borders um, and that was all the more important to really re reflect and articulate the added value of international and uh, internationalization and finally maybe a, an important point to highlight was that there was a real need for us to um, better value um, pedagogical excellence and to really reward pedagogical excellence um, and to um, provide incentives for um, uh, transformations in uh, pedagogy. So with that in mind, we uh, then following this paper, there was a there were a number of um, seminar series where we tried to explore some of these themes in greater depth. Um, and that seminar series was hosted by a number of partners uh, and guild member universities um, right across Europe. So it started with the University of Warwick, which um, really engaged with this question of uh, micro-credentials and uh, transnational um, um, and lifelong learning. Um, we then um, had uh, followed this up with a seminar um, hosted by the University of Aarhus, which really looked at this question of um, um, building and creating standards that, that in a sense help us and not hinder us, and that are, in, that are meant as enabling frameworks. Um, and then most, more recently, we had a, a, you know, a, a, a seminar hosted by the University of Tartu, which was around national strategies um, and the role of universities in integrating the international uh, students uh, to the local labor market. And we're looking forward to a final series for now, um, no, a final seminar in this series hosted by the University of Tübingen in the early uh, part of the summer. But today I'm really delighted that we can go to the University of Glasgow um, because this is a really special seminar uh, in, in this series, a really special workshop, because it is one thing to um, develop thematic approaches to some of these challenges 
around a pedagogy in higher education. But it's quite another to then really think through about how you create educational change in, a, in an institution. How do you involve um, you know, the infrastructure, the systems, the IT systems, the students and the staff? How do you create a vision that really brings all of these uh, actors together um, and that really produces a change uh, that really then also has the desired outcomes at the end. And that's, of course, a hugely challenging question for all of us who are in, who are in pedagogical institutions, universities, and, and other institutions of, of, of learning. And so I'm really delighted that we can really explore this, this, this question in an institutional context, in an institution that really has, has embraced this challenge uh, now for quite a number uh, of years. And so I'm really very happy to uh, now pass over to uh, Moira Fischbacher-Smith, who is the uh, Vice Principal for um, Education um, uh, at uh, the University of Glasgow, who will lead us through this, um, uh, through today's um, uh, sessions, uh, both in the morning and afternoon. And we, uh, once again, I'd really encourage all of you to, um, uh, to really participate really actively uh, in this discussion. And we really look forward, uh, not only to learning from Glasgow, but also learning from your own perspectives um, as you engage with what uh, you hear uh, from the speakers. Maura, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to now hearing from your uh, colleagues on this really important subject. Thank you, Jan. And good morning, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here. So thank you to the Guild for inviting us to, to share our experiences of rethinking our approach to, to teaching and to learning. And thank you to everybody who's here for making the time to come along today. We, in developing this particular building and this approach, we have benefited so much from other people across the world sharing their experiences of similar types of projects with us. And uh, so we're really pleased to be able to share our experiences to help other people in the way that we've been supported. But also, you know, the idea is to work collectively so we each keep building on one another's ideas and innovating and developing our approaches to supporting students in their learning. So uh, delighted to be able to do this. Um, as Jan mentioned, we have two sections to this event. Um, the first focus is really on the process that we went through and how we were rethinking teaching and learning how we work together in, in new ways, new ways for us, they might not be new for all of you, but they were new ways for us. And some of the challenges that we set ourselves in, in taking a new approach to thinking about study spaces and teaching and learning spaces on campus. And the second session is on how we are working with colleagues and students now to translate that vision into practice. And although we're separating them into the two sessions for the purposes of this event, I should say that the work was integrated from the outset. We didn't just build a building and then start to work with colleagues on how to change. We did everything from the beginning. And although, as I say, it's split a little bit into two sessions, we hope it's clear that this was an integrated process and, and that you're able to attend for both sessions to see how that all came, is coming together. Um, because of the pandemic, some of our original time scales have changed a little and we've not been able to bring students together in the spaces quite as we had intended, but we have adapted and I know Jan visited the building yesterday and saw that it's it's being used in, uh, to the full. <laughs> um, students are in every corner of the space and our vision remains to embed collaborative learning and teaching across all of our spaces in the university, as I hope you'll hear. Um, and, and really just to emphasize at this point before I turn to my colleagues, that it's this notion of collaboration and learning that's underpinning the active learning approach that's been a revision from the start. And so we very much hope that what we have to share with you today will be inspiring and thought provoking for you and that there'll be something for everybody here to take away and that you'll get a really good sense of the, the building that you saw in the video that we sent around in advance, um, how that came into being. And if anyone hasn't seen that, it only lasts for two minutes and we'd encourage you to watch it in the break. Um, we do appreciate that this opportunity to build an entirely new building, um, and it's a very big venture, as you'll see when Nicola talks through the plans, has been a particular catalyst for change for us. But I think we also believe that even if you don't have an equivalent project, there are still approaches that we took that might be useful to you and you know particularly in terms of how we work with stakeholders and how we're trying to support changing teaching practice because we also want to embed that into the renovation of existing spaces and not just have you know an amazing building that students may get to experience at some point in their studies we want to really take this ethos through everything that we do so i very much hope that there's something for each of you to take from here um, I'm going to introduce my, my colleagues on the panel in a moment or two, but just to say I will be keeping an eye on the chat function. So as Jan said, please do put your questions in and we will try and answer as many of them as possible. Um, OK, so I will I will introduce my colleagues in the order that they're contributing to this session. So maybe um, 
Nicola, if you could just say who you are and, and your role, and I'll come to then Dave, then Lauren, then Nick, and then Liam, and then we'll start with our, our input before the Q&A. Nicola, thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicola Cameron. Uh, my title at the university is Director of Property Development and Investment. Um, I joined the university in 2014 specifically to work on this project and our, our wider master plan. Um, I was only meant to be there for two years, but um, have madly fallen in love uh, and probably will never leave. And I've just been so excited to be here. And as Moira said, for me, the most important thing about all of this has, has been the collaboration. And my colleagues that are on this call with me today, we've worked just so closely together to ensure this is both transformational uh, and I would suggest a huge success. So, hello. Thanks, Nicola. Uh, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dave Anderson. My job title is Director for Relationship Management and Engagement, which is, is part of Information Services, um, which comprises our library and IT functions to the university. Uh, that role really um, is, is kind of summed up in, in engagement. It's about talking to our service users and ensuring that the services that my colleagues in the library and IT are, are delivering back to the, the institution are what the institution are expecting, both staff, student, teaching and research. Um, I've been at the university for slightly longer than Nicola. I joined in 1995 um, and my role has changed and developed and I have seen the university change and develop over that time. Um, and this project has been sort of a key part in, in developing and moving on and preparing ourselves for the next challenge, um, which I'm sure will be just around the corner. Um, so yes, delighted to be here and looking forward to, to present and sharing with you all. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Lauren. Hi, folks. Good morning. Um, I'm Lauren McDougall. My job title at the moment is Student Experience and Partnership Lead, um, but I'm here in my capacity as a former student president of the Students' Representative Council. Um, and, and like Nicola, um, been here for a while unexpectedly. I joined as a mature student in 2010 and I'm still here now, probably firmly bedded in and like Nicola, probably never leaving. Um, but here today to share the sort of first elements of student partnership in this project um, and what that collaboration looks like in practice. Thanks Lauren. Uh, Nick. Good morning, uh, I'm Nick. Uh, so my job title is Deputy Director Academic and Digital Development and I lead the Academic and Digital Development team and you'll hear this uh, this afternoon, I can, I can highly recommend uh, the, um, the session by, by Vicky, so that's one of my colleagues. And uh, we sit in academic services. I joined in 2017 coming from the east side of the Scottish central belt. So now I'm in the west side. I can tell you already that I absolutely fell in love with the building, um, not just at the start when we were all working together, which was an amazing opportunity and experience, but actually being in the building. And what we do, well, it's, it's very much in the title, um, luckily, so we are um, responsible for supporting academic staff, developing academic staff, which obviously ultimately in uh, the goal is to this, the, in, enhance the student uh, learning experience. Thank you, Nick. And Liam. Yes, thanks, Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Liam Brady, and I currently work at the university as a student support officer. Um, but similar to Lauren, I'm here in my capacity as a former sabbatical officer in the Students' Representative Council. So I held positions of Vice President Education and then President um, towards sort of the end of the project life cycle of the James McGinn Smith. Um, yeah, so I'm also a current student at the minute for my sins as well, so I can chip in in that <laughs> aspect as well. Yeah, that's me. Thanks, Liam. Okay, I'm not going to say how long I've worked at the university, but I also love it. I've been here a very long time and this has been one of the most amazing um, opportunities to work across the institution that I think I've ever had. It's been really great. Um, okay, so I think we're, we're going to, Nicola's going to start by sharing a presentation with you that really, I think, gives you the background and the context of what we were trying to achieve. And, and she and Dave will talk through some of that before I turn to, to Lauren. So Nicola, over to you. You should be able to share your presentation. I'm hoping everyone can see that now. Yep. So 
this is going to be a whistle stop tour. Um, I have a lot of slides, but I love pictures. And actually, I, I genuinely love this building. So you are going to see this building again and again and again in every single aspect of it. Um, this came about in 2014. We, we had this amazing opportunity to expand our campus. Um, there was a hospital adjacent to us. They were moving to a new site. Um, we had the opportunity to acquire the, the hospital site. So it gave us 14 acres. And that was really important because where else would you get 14 acres just on your doorstep? So we really started to think about this, this opportunity. So this was our existing campus and this here was our expansion area. But it, it was an amazing opportunity, but it was also a terrifying opportunity. But it gave us this moment to really think about how are we going to reshape? How are we going to do things differently? Um, and we speak a lot in our university about how are we going to transform? How were we genuinely going to make a step change? And um, that was in, in all aspects, our learning, our teaching, um, our, our student experience, and how actually our, our staff um, engaged with the campus, and also how our university engaged with the city. So Mo Moira always uses the phrase, you know, we were, we were looking to transform rather than just translate. And I think that that's key to everything that we, the journey's we've gone on since that time away back in 2014. You'll see there my big red love heart um, and in actual fact that's the site of our learning and teaching hub um, and I think that that's critical. Um, you'll see the blue was our existing campus, the green is our expanded campus. The learning and teaching hub we put on a site that we already had. It was an old car park that, that was just every day filled with cars, doing really nothing apart from, um, you know, an eyesore. And we recognised that that site there was absolutely at the heart, not just of our existing, but as we expanded, it became even more important. And it created this area of balance between the old and the new. And we identified it as absolutely the right place for a new facility focusing on our student experience, because it was pivotal in its location, but also it did this important job of, of creating a space on the campus for our students to be. We have a huge campus, it's leafy, it's green, but there were very few spaces for our students to actually just come and to be. And, and we were keen that we started to become a really sticky campus. We gave our students a reason to stay, to stay longer, to stay and build new friendships, new relationships, new networks. And so this site was absolutely pivotal to really readdressing the balance. And then we looked at, you know, so here's the, the GMS, the, the learning teaching hub there, and this is our new expanded campus. And you can see it all starts to beautifully bend together. But the university took a decision to actually focus our, our energies on the learning and teaching hub before we actually did any of this, because it was so important to us to really start to work on enhancing that student experience. The site itself was very interesting. Um, it had huge levels differences. It faced onto um, a main road in, in one side, it faced onto a leafy um, sort of almost pseudo residential area on the other side. Um, it, it had a levels difference from back to front. It had a levels difference from right to left. Uh, it had a beautiful 1960s um, concrete monolith beside it, our beautiful Boyd Orr building. And um, we really started to think about, well, how do we, it, 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 I'm a surveyor, so this site would have been the, the ultimate exam question, you know, what do you actually do with this site? Because it had underlying ground conditions, it had a little bit of contamination, it had an existing building, it had levels differences. So it was the perfect exam question. But we felt, well, let's actually harness those challenges and turn them into opportunities for us. And so you can see that we started to look at, well, the levels differences gave us lots of different opportunities for arrival points. You know, so how were people going to really use this building 
as a place that they came to, but a place that they cut through. We used the levels to enhance the accessibility of the campus. So the building itself actually allows people to move through different levels of our campus in a really seamless uh, and accessible way. We started to think about, well, how do you tie in to the boy door? You know, how instead of just creating one building, can we actually create a complex and scale up everything that we're thinking about? So we harnessed the boy door to give us additional space. We thought about, you know, you have all these amazing views. So how do we really start to look at the, the sort of the, the drawing light into the building? How do we create simple wayfinding? For anyone who's been to our campus, it's absolutely stunning. It's very hard sometimes to find your way around. And um, all of us who work on the campus spend our first month of every term in sort of September helping students find a room because you just see them standing looking slightly bamboozled because it is very hard to orientate yourself. So with this building, we felt it was important to almost stack the types of spaces to add to that sense of ownership and uh, an ease of orientation. So we stacked our learning and teaching and we stacked our study spaces. And then every space in between is doing a job. And so we, we talked about the nooks and crannies, um, which is a very Scottish term. So those, those little spaces that you find we wanted them to be working hard for us as well. There is no wasted space in this entire building. And it's been beautiful to see students coming in and actually just enjoying the nooks and crannies because there are big spaces, but there are also those small, much more sort of human intimate sized spaces. So that, that was the, the sort of the, the concept. And you can see from this um, sort of, the cut through of the design, it was a really open and permeable building. Um, interestingly, this was the first building that the university, and possibly the last, but it was the first building that um, we put escalators in because we had to really think about that vertical transfer of students. At any one point, there could be three, four, five thousand students in this building. And we needed to get them moving around quickly. And in a way, that introduction of something like escalators started to get us thinking about what does that mean for everything else that happens in the building? And I used to liken this building to colleagues. It's like a small airport. There are people coming through continually. It's like a very busy shopping center. People are there, they're doing things, they're in, they're out. And therefore, everything that we did had to shift to match that. So in the old days, um, we would have come in and we would have cleaned a building like this at eight o'clock in the morning before our students arrived. Uh, and then that would be it. And, you know, the next day we would come in and clean it again at eight o'clock. With this building, we have a team who are constantly checking everything, They're, you know, checking the toilets, emptying the bins, because this is just so busy. We started to recognise that the, the ways we had previously been doing things weren't going to support this building. And we'll, we'll sort of come on to that um, later. Nicola, Again, just- Nicola, Nicola, just a quick question. Someone's put in the Q&A when we say we, who exactly do we, we mean? So I know, I know we will pick this up as we go through, but just when you're speaking, if it's possible to mention who the, you know, where the architects played a part and so on, just so we pick that up as we go along. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely. And, and I do say we, and um, it's not it's not me, just the we. It, it was an amazing collaboration. And actually, Moira will testify to this, that when we started this project, um, we actually said, you're not going to meet an architect for the you know a considerable amount of time because we, the university, so myself, Moira, Dave, um, other colleagues who aren't here today, we had to spend time working out what we wanted this building to do. We worked with Lauren, you know, we, we engaged with our students. What did they want? What did they need? What was missing from the campus? This building doesn't sit alone. It is part of a wider ecosystem of spaces. So we have an amazing library. We've got, you know, student services. So what did this building need to do? Of course, it has, you know, fantastic teaching facilities in it and great study spaces. But what were all the other things 
that this building had to do. And so we kept the architects out of the conversation for, for the start of it because we needed to be sure of our own vision. And then when we brought them in, it was actually, it was a wonderful collaboration. We worked very closely with the architects and if they were here today, they would say that, yes, we were probably a very um, annoying client at times, but that we were great because we were involved in every step of the process and we genuinely knew what it was we were trying to achieve. So when I say we, it's, it's the wonderful team that we had. Just a quick image of, of where we got to, sorry more I flipped on there, but just, just to show you how we started to use the building, linking into the boy door, stacking the spaces <clears throat> to aid orientation, really creating routes through and around, and actually importantly for us, drawing the, the, the sort of surrounding landscape in and making the best of the, the wonderful lights. So we have one sort of south facing elevation, we um, clad that all in glass um, so that we could bring the light in. Anyone who's ever visited Glasgow knows that sometimes we don't get a lot of sun. So when we were getting it, we wanted to make sure that our students were getting the benefit of that natural light and those views out. Everywhere in this building, there is a window that you get a great view. And we worked very hard to make sure that, that the windows were framing views. So you can actually see my background. This is one of the views out of our window. Um, in the JMS, you know, again, framing that, that great Gilbert Scott Tower that we have. So I was talking there about that sort of southern elevation, um, really creating this light shedding out into the surrounding environment to give our students that sense of there's activity there, there's, you know, there's people, and really working to draw them in. Um, I think I was speaking about the, the vision. We worked very hard on the vision and, and it was very clear to us what we were doing. And I always like to show this side. So on the left is the architect's um, sort of representation of what it would look like. And on the right is actual the building. So we, we stayed pretty true to our vision of what these spaces were going to do for us. But importantly, as part of that vision, and Moira's mentioned that, you know, we, we collaborated with a number of different universities across the, the globe, and um, many were so kind in their time and, you know, their, their learnings that they, they had undertaken. So, for example, with McGill, um, their lesson to us was, you know, set out your design principles, set out what it is you're trying to do. And we worked to create a set of design principles. And as Moira said, it's important for us that this, this concept is rolled out across the entire campus. We can't just have students coming into our, our GMS and um, having this amazing platinum experience and then going into some of our older spaces and really feeling that um, you know, they've had a slightly sort of bronze experience. So our design principles allow us when we're doing refurbishment to try where possible to really have a consistency of experience. And we also learned, you know, we're creating an ecosystem here. It would be very easy to build a building and to hand it over to colleagues and say, there you go. But actually we worked together and started to truly understand that if the student experience was at the heart of everything we were doing, that encompassed so many other aspects. And, you know, Dave's here, we worked so closely with IT. How, how did the IT um, enhance the experience in a seamless integrated way? How did it support the teaching? How did we support our, our students to study? Um, how did the service model that sat behind all of this all work seamlessly so that the students just came in and enjoyed the space and it supported them in their learning and those sort of um, social moments that they had? We understood as well from speaking with other colleagues, simple is good. Um, I went to see a building in Australia that um, they had put millions of dollars of IT kit in. And when I said, how is it all working? And they said, oh, actually, we've never switched it on. Um, so we, we realized simple is good. And um, we worked closely with partners, um, Steelcase, to get the, the best writing surfaces. And actually throughout the entire building, if there was a wall that wasn't being used for something else, it's got a writable surface on it. Um, and again, really encouraging people 
to um, just take ownership of the building. We wanted our students to come in, enjoy it, engage with it, and feel that sense of ownership. There are very few signs in the building telling you what to do, which, which is just a joy to me. When we opened the doors, students just came in and got on with it as if they'd always been there. And actually, that, that's the best testament to the design that I can ever ask for. What else did we learn? And Dave, was, Dave can jump in on this. You know, don't overspect the technology. Um, we particularly looked at um, the connectivity in the building. How do you make it seamless for our academics coming in? Or we may have people coming in to teach in this building for the first time. How do we make that as you know the minimal stress experience as possible? And also that assumption around, and it's, it's, it's grown exponentially even since we started this project, people have multiple devices. And with multiple devices comes the need for multiple charging. And so one of the things that we focused on in this building was um, plugs and sockets. How do our students get power? Um, and that, that's always the biggest challenge. Dave, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you, Nicola. Um... Picking up on the point Nicola was making there around the technology and how we evolved that, the James McQueen Smith building is part of a much wider ecosystem. So while the teaching spaces within the new building are state of the art and are carefully designed and considered, we wanted to make sure that we weren't leaving the rest of the campus behind and that staff and students moving from our existing campus into the new building would feel part of a consistent University of Glasgow presence. Um, we did that through standardising some of our technology interfaces, so the teaching space lecterns, the control panels, staff trained in the James Coon Smith building would be able to teach in any of our buildings and vice versa. Um, and similarly, from a student experience, the Wi-Fi connectivity and the support service model was consistent with the, the model that we have across campus. Um, as part of that, I use that as a, an ideal opportunity to review our support model across campus mm -hmm. and through engagement with students, we developed what was what has become, sorry, what has come to be called our reach out support model, which um, was branded and designed by students through a student competition and essentially puts in place peer support for students using our services with um, staff involvement, IT help desk, library facilities, and a one team approach so that we are able to deliver a, a consistent joined up service. As part of that um, approach, we are currently in the middle of our annual review period. So we're looking at what's working and what we need to improve on. And this whole project has kick-started that service improvement um, methodology and given us that opportunity to go in there and, and they'd listen to the users and make make changes where they're required. Just speaking to this slide, when I was given the brief of the, the James McKean Smith building from a technical perspective, um, once I had got my head around the enormity of the whole thing, um, actually, it's, it's quite a, a simple challenge breaking it down, um, looking at who the building users are, what will they be doing when they're in the building, how will they be interacting with the technology and does that change throughout, throughout the period? And it does. We have you know, formal teaching events running through you know, normal university teaching hours and all of the spaces are available for students and student societies outside of that. And one of the, the underlying visions was to make sure that this building was usable and used um, as much as, as, as we, could, we could manage and support. And it's been fa fantastic to see students using the spaces for a huge number of activities um, and using the technology in a way that uh, is seamless and they're able to make use of the resources that are there and make use of the spaces in ways that we as a board haven't envisaged but we have provided that canvas to, to let students develop and make use of the space and make it their own which I think is really important. So my role in, in that has really been kind of translating the requirements coming from, from Moira and from the learning and teaching streams, from Nicola and the estates development and how the, the infrastructure is, is interconnected, translating that to a, a language that my, my technical colleagues understand, checking that, reiterating, 
um, and through an iterative process, developing what has become the, the AV in, um, installations in the, the classrooms, teaching spaces, and the, the, the Wi-Fi development across the, the, the building itself, but underlined and underpinned by the, the support model, which I think is, is the biggest success factor, the technology changes, it develops, but having that support there and having a front foot support. So rather than students or users of the building necessarily having to go to a particular area to ask a question or to ask for assistance, we have roaming um, peer support, reach out staff who will be now there. And if students are um, looking for help, they can, they can receive that where they are rather than having to, to go to a particular location. And that's developing and maturing as we go. And we're now taking that same support model and using that as the baseline for the other campus buildings as they're, they're coming on stream. I'm, I'm just going to quickly flick us on. So in addition to everything that, that we've just spoken about, we, we recognise this building needed other things. Um, you, you know, if we wanted our students to really come in, to embrace it, to own it, to dwell there, to, you know, to feel that it was, you know, a home away from home, a place they wanted to be, um, we recognised it needed not just coffee but great food and different catering options throughout the day and throughout the building. And so we worked with our colleagues in our commercial team to really understand how could we do catering differently in this building. Um, and I think that that was critical, actually. You know, I wouldn't understate the importance of really engaging with the student body, asking them what they wanted, um, and then trying to deliver that. Um, we also recognised that not everyone can or wants to buy their lunch from, you know, from the university. So we created student kitchens in this building, and we put microwaves and zip taps for those that wanted to bring things in from home. Um, and again. You know, if, if you were having an intense study day, you could be in this building from, you know, eight in the morning till eight at night. So you, you're going to bring your bits and bobs that, that make you comfortable as you're going through that journey on your day. So the, again, the microwaves, the zip taps, we've got um, chilled water on all of the floors for students to access. So really trying to think about the things that, that would make it just the most supportive space it could be. Coffee is really important and there is a, a plethora of coffee outlets in the in the building, but also we've put really, really high quality coffee vending in the building um, so that people can get coffee out with those sort of um, those key hours where our catering is operating. The other thing that we looked at was lockers. Um, where do people leave their stuff? You know, everybody's got quite a lot of stuff nowadays. So we worked closely again with our colleagues um, or our, our partners Steelcase to get the best locker solutions and to stop people having to fiddle about with keys, our lockers tie in to you know, the student card. So it just was to make it as easy as possible to enjoy and be in this building. And I mentioned it earlier, but I'll mention it again, never ever underestimate the need for sockets. Um, we had to, our building has a, a concrete floor so we've had to bring power in from above. And actually we came up with really innovative solutions where we have power cords that people can just pull down. And then at the end you retract and they go back up. So just never underestimate how many devices people genuinely want to plug in. Um, so we started to think about all of the other things that would make a building feel like a place you wanted to be. Messages from study space, again, you know, we said it about technology, we said it about other things, keep it simple. Um, we wanted our students as well to own these spaces um, and also understanding that study needs change throughout the year. So we made sure that the furniture was as flexible as possible, that people could configure it. We had really interesting discussions with our janitors at the start, and this is the same of the teaching spaces. Um, well, who'll reset that room at the end of every night or who'll reset that, um, that study space? And we said it doesn't need to be reset. People will just move the furniture so that they can use it for what their need is at that moment in time. And it took us a long time to kind of break that pattern. 
And again, this building has, has done that across the entire campus. So we've really changed a lot of the service models that we have across the campus. And, and this building, the JMS, was definitely the catalyst for that shift in our thinking. Um, Dave mentioned there the, the reach out. I, I won't speak to these slides, but you know, we worked with our students. We started to think about what people needed. The way I always explain it is we used to have a service model that was like the, the, the cheese counter in a supermarket and you would take a ticket and wait in line to be served. Um, we shifted that much more to the, the Google, uh, not the Google, the, oh, what do you call it? The Apple shop, um, you know, the, the genius bar with people out roving and helping and being really visible and available. And we recognize that a lot of questions can be relatively easily triaged you know how do i get to connect to the printer how, how where do i where do i collect my printing my my laptop isn't linking to the wi-fi these are the general questions we get and so we triage them on the floor and then when the questions are more difficult our, our reach out team can then show you how to get the more specialized service that you require and it's been unbelievably successful i would suggest and i'm just going to say um you know we've had I think Dave, will, Dave can back me up on this with 19,000 digital adult inquiries since its launch, super positive feedback from students and actually the brand recognition, you know, the colors, people know who to look for, for assistance. Um, and it's it's been very, very positive and again, fundamental to the success of the, the facility and that whole piece around transforming. And then a last couple of slides from me, I just like to... Um, to show the building itself um, you, you know people just sitting about doing things always you know somebody's got a laptop there's plugs that you can see there even on the sort of the bleacher seats that are sort of quite informal we put sockets for people to plug in um, every space is a space that people want to use um, so I think uh, that that's everything from me but the the best moment that I had with this whole building and I've worked on it for a long time and I'm, I'm, I'm very much in love with it was when we opened the doors and our students just came in and got on with it we didn't have to explain it we didn't have to put signs up we didn't have to have people directing them they just came in and got on with it and started to enjoy it and what I love is that you know next semester September the students, the new students that will arrive will think this has always been here. They won't know the, you know, the tears and the angst that we all had delivering this. They will just think it's always been here and it will be part of their lives. So, um, and that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. <clears throat> okay, so um, thank you for that. And I, I hope that that kind of holistic introduction has, has given everybody a sense of the, the scale and the of what we were trying to achieve and and why we've why we've talked about systems and processes and ecosystems because it's so fundamental to to the whole concept i'm going to pass over now to um lauren who's going to say something about how we worked with the students nicola's mentioned students a number of times this whole building was for students and we really wanted to transform the student experience um but i'll i'll give you some time to hear this from the perspective of Lauren in her former former role and then subsequently Liam when they were involved in their student capacity. Lauren. Thank you, Moira. I don't have slides this morning because I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture of a story here. So there's nothing really for you to look at. Um, and I am going to give a bit of context because I realise that we have a really diverse audience this morning who may not know the approaches to student partnership within a Scottish context or specifically within the University of Glasgow. So it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but hopefully it will help set the scene and give some key contextual examples of how we actually enacted that collaboration at Glasgow. Um, so we're going to start with my involvement, which began back in 2015. So quite near the beginning of the project. Um, and it's worth noting that the collaboration on this project also predated me. So this was something the SRC, which is Glasgow Students Representative Council, was involved as a core part of this project from the very beginning. Um, 
So just to set that scene around student partnership at Glasgow, so you can really see the foundation that we were working on. Um, Glasgow is quite unique in that we have four different student organisations rather than one student union or guild. But what this means is that the Students' Representative Council, which is the, the legal representative body of students, is really able to focus on that representative angle um, and on learning and teaching enhancement and, and student support. And within that Students' Representative Council, which you'll hear us call the SRC from here on in, um, there are four sabbatical officers. So these are four full-time paid student officers who are elected by the student body to represent them. Um, and these sabbatical officers tend to be very interwoven into the, the running of the university and in representing students' voices on everything from new policy implementation to things like this enormous estates development. Um, and in addition to that, the SRC also has academic representatives and welfare and equal opportunities representatives, which are volunteer student roles, which are elected and represent the student body for a year. So it's important to, to realise here that the SRC were already very involved in a range of activity at the university from learning and teaching strategy and policy right through to equality and diversity in the broader student experience. Um, in addition to the, the council part of SRC, we also have around 800 to 1,000 course representatives, who we'll mention later on as well, who are involved in leading change at a very local area uh, level within the sort of local subject areas and degree programmes. Um, and so they're really the ears on the ground of what students want, and they kind of represent often the, the change, and it's through that kind of representative structure of the class reps feeding student feedback right up to the sabbatical officers at the top that makes our representative our representative structures so effective at Glasgow, I would say. Um, but within that, I think it's also important to recognise that student partnership and collaboration is, is very much part of the Scottish national context in HE. This is something which is legislated and regulated. Student partnership is embedded within um, our quality processes and our governance. So this isn't something that's coming from, from nothing. Glasgow sits as part of a broader context. But what I would say is that Glasgow in particular has been commended for the strength of student partnership. Um, and it's something that both the, the students themselves feel, but also the staff members recognise that the value that comes from that really embedded student partnership. But despite all of that, despite all of that context, student representatives don't really come into post expecting to be involved in estates development. This was something entirely new to the students getting involved in this project. Most of us, when we stand for election, you know, we, we have manifestos that are shaped around the student experience, that are shaped around learning and teaching, um, extracurricular activities, not around the building of buildings. <laughs> um, I, I still recall the moment that I learned what a baffle was um, and never mind just learning what it was but learning having opinions about what it should look like and where it should go. Um, so I think it's important to, to, to recognise that this does represent a real shift and a steep learning curve for the students involved in these projects. This was not something that any of us had been involved in before. Um, so I think this added layer of complexity you know, it added challenges, um, but what I will say is that we had such a strong partnership with the state's colleagues who really supported the student representatives in getting to grips with this new landscape and all of the new terminology and everything that we needed to understand really quite quickly. Um, because one of the, the unique contexts for student reps is they were often involved in this project for, for a year. Um, student reps are generally elected for a single term of office and some of us stick around <laughs> and get involved in more and more, but there are students who have to, to get to grips with really complex things really very quickly. And something that I have reflected on a lot is just how important that relationship was with the estates team and how essential they were in equipping the students to be able to, to really meaningfully contribute to the project. Um, so for me, it was about ensuring that those students could be effective partners. And as somebody who started very early in the project, I really was supported to, to be able to understand what I was doing and contribute really meaningfully. And I think what's testament to that is the, the amount of students who've gone on to actually work as part of the campus redevelopment, um, who have really kind of experienced a really steep learning curve, but discovered new things that interest them. And, and we've had students who've taken on internships and who've gone on to work in permanent roles within the estates team due to their involvement in this project, which I think speaks really highly of the, 
just how how embedded that student partnership was. It wasn't ever tokenistic. It really felt very genuine. Um, so just to think about a couple of the examples and, and the way that we actually did that, as is Nicola has said, and Moira said right at the beginning, this was never just about a building. This was about a transformation in the way that students learn um, and with students contributing to that vision for transformation from the very beginning. Um, everything we're talking about this morning as well, I think is important to reiterate, as Nicola said, can be applied to any project. So regardless of whether you're building a 90 million pound, huge learning and teaching building, or you're refurbing some spaces, or you're thinking about a new approach to learning and teaching, really it's about the, the key tenets of that partnership, I think, that are important to focus on here. Um, and for me, that was always about a shared vision and a shared philosophy for the future of learning and teaching at Glasgow. And students really contributed to the shaping of that vision from the very beginning through workshops, through participation in committees and working groups, um, through surveys. There were so many different methods that we used to involve the student voice. And the student voice is, I should say, because something that's really important to, to acknowledge as well is the diversity of the student body. Glasgow is an enormous university with around, well, over 30,000 students. Now I think we're close to 35,000 undergraduate and postgraduate students from a really diverse range of backgrounds. So Glasgow has a really significant international student population and a really large local student population from in and around Glasgow. So there's something really important there about catering to that diversity and recognising that there was never a single student voice. And that was captured through the variety of ways that students were involved. Um, despite there not being a single approach, there were some key messages coming through from the students through the representative structure that really helped to shape that ethos. So we knew that students wanted more active learning, participatory learning about inclusive and flexible learning spaces, more work, more space for group work, for extracurricular activities, and really to come back to, I think Nicola mentioned this concept of sticky campus. So creating a facility where students would want to come and stay. And students shaped what that looked like from the very beginning, right from the first accessibility review of the building plans in 2015, which I was involved in, which resulted in concrete changes to that floor plan to make that building more accessible for our students. As we mentioned, the design principles that under pinned every element of not just this building but the campus redevelopment as a whole was shaped by students. Students were involved in the committee that pulled that together. Students contributed ideas through surveys, through workshops to what that inclusive design looked like. So that's not just about learning and teaching spaces. It's also about the importance of having showers on campus, having student kitchens, having reflective spaces and prayer spaces. These were all things that underpinned those design principles to ensure that this building and all of our buildings indeed are really focused on what our students need and what they want from that. Um, as Dave mentioned, we also held a student competition to design and brand the service model, which was incredible as one of the judges on that. Um, the level of creativity and ingenuity from the student submissions was incredible and seeing that now on campus, those students will have long graduated, but knowing that they have left behind that legacy, I think is pretty incredible. Um, and in addition to that, I've mentioned the formal student partnership, the sabbatical officers, council members, but there were also pop-up consultation and engagement events, getting ideas from students who were in no way engaged with student representation at all, really ensuring that that broad student experience was captured. Um, it really was at every single stage of that process. And I think that's what is really important to recognize is this wasn't just about coming in at the end. This was about shaping the very ethos of the building and the approach to learning and teaching. And that that was, really founded upon a strong foundation already of student partnership and collaboration at Glasgow. So I think my key message is around ensuring that you make good use of those existing partnerships with students to make sure that these projects are really speaking to, to the needs of your students and that you create a building that feels like home on campus, which I think really we have managed to do with this building. Um, I'm not going to talk about how students are using the space. I'll leave that to, to Liam. I think he'll probably cover that briefly. Um, but I'm now going to pass over to Nick, who's going to talk a little bit about the staff involvement in the development and design. Yes, thank you. So uh, let me just share my slides. Here we go. So um, just to reiterate uh, what, what Lauren has said is um, bring in your your staff or educational developers early on as well. So um, 
I, I mentioned before, uh, I started in 2017, so there's a little bit about my team. So we currently have 13 full-time members of staff with seven academic and digital advisors. And I was actually almost a little bit surprised myself that I was asked to, to join and, and therefore for our team to join. And immediately it became clear why, because of the whole transformation. And you've got the staff, um, who contribute, you have the students who contribute, but also I think you need a bit of a meta overview here. We are transforming learning, we are transforming teaching, so the support needs to be there. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. So the question is, uh, to me, it was always why was there such a wide and varied team that was so early on part of the development of the hub? Well, why the student staff partnerships? Well, and Lauren um, explained the reason why. And well, wh why did we even want something like the JMS Learning Hub? Well, it comes down to, again, what my colleagues have already talked about. So we're changing teaching. But then we also have the question, are we changing learning? I put in the question mark, but uh, I would say, well, yes, we are. <laughs> It is driven by students and staff. I mean, that is hopefully really clear already from what we have been talking about. This might sound a little bit out there, but really I feel that it is not just a building, it's a philosophy. It's far more than that. It's, it's, it's not just a space. And really I think that everybody who goes into that space realizes it is more than that. It's all about why the JMS, it is all about learning, but actually it's all about active learning. And it is so important that this has been at the forefront of everything we've done and, and our thinking about this building. Um, because there is of course a bit of a difference between perhaps sometimes more classic, traditional old ideas of learning and active. Now, early on, uh, I remember we were sitting down with a team and we were thinking about, okay, so we've got this, we're going to build a building. And by then we had um, uh, architectural drawings, et cetera, already, because we're talking about 2017, 18. And we were thinking about, well, learning and, and, and where does learning take place? Well, we obviously have going to have a building. We have physical spaces, but active learning very, very often also includes um, technology. So we also have some sort of online spaces very often, but that's a very important one. To be able to learn, to be in your best position to learn, the mental spaces are incredibly important. So all of these need to come together and none of them should really be the one that uh, stands out more, which is why it goes back to this whole philosophy. It's not just a building and then we're thinking about the other things. We have been thinking about all of those spaces at the same time. So the question is, what's the bit in the middle? Is it the zone? Um, you could put lots of different uh, uh, labels on it, I think, but if everything comes together, then I think it might be a little bit of a Shangri-La, I suppose. And um, let's hope that students are able to experience that. Um, I would think they, they might do, but I'm not a student anymore, so we need to ask them. And we have. So we've heard about the principles, we've heard, and, and now um, the way we're thinking about active learning is, so we summarize this. So um, as students, well, what does it mean? They should be active and not passive learners. So not talking at them. Therefore, all of the building is designed for interaction of diverse means. They should have the opportunity to engage and learn with peers. You, when you look at the building, there are so many spaces where you can do exactly that. Oh, basically, they're just everywhere. From the steps that you saw to um, little um, study nooks and little study study spaces that look like a, a oh, difficult to explain. I haven't got a photo of that one, but it kind of looks like a block with, 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 with a window and you've got a table around it. Um, to the massive lecture theatre, where you can actually turn around and talk to the person behind you because these things are designed that way. Um, 
they should be constructing understanding by building on and expanding existing knowledge, uh, have the chance to contribute to their own learning. Again, that's a very important core that uh, tenant that went throughout our design principles. And of course, they should become independent self-directed learners guided by staff. And that's once more the way the building is, is set up because of all of those spaces coming together. So active learning, yes, incredibly important, but that's not all. What about inclusive active learning? Very early on, we started to realize um, that there isn't really much research out there. And we did a literature review and we were looking at specifically inclusive active learning. And there wasn't really anything. There is a lot about inclusivity and Nicola already talked about, and, and also Lauren talked about all that work that went into to make the building accessible. That was in hand, but inclusive, active learning is even more than that. It needs to be welcome, it needs to be there for everybody. And we were still making assumptions while we were designing it. And I get to that. So this is rotating because we did some, uh, because it is a, um, a poster that um, research participants were working on from all sides. So we did a little research project uh, using rich pictures methodology. And we asked participants there, well, what does your ideal learning, inclusive learning space looks like? Well, unsurprisingly, look at the bit here on the, on the bottom. So all gender bathrooms. And guess what? That is everywhere in the building. Um, no, nothing is binary. Oh, no, we don't do that. All of the bathrooms, all of the toilets are, avail uh, are for everybody. And they're all single ones and they're all big and they're all accessible. And that is amazing. That is, that is I think, the really important bit behind it that we don't single out. Everything is for everybody. And you can see this here. So these are photos that were taken before the building was opened. But let's see, for example, this one. What you see here on the um, chair on the left, it's not just you, you, you and I was wondering about, you know, what's this little wheelie thing there? Well, actually, this chair goes all the way up so that it becomes a stool. And when you look at the tables here on the right, now I remember we were really practical as well in, in, in designing for, for learning. So I remember being there with, with my team and, and others as well in the university and testing out furniture. And one of the furniture had uh, the, this bit of the, oh, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. This bit of the table was, uh, went up and down, but not the others. And again, we had this whole inclusivity uh, ethos behind it, I thought, but no, no, everything should go up and down because we don't want to single out somebody. We want to make it as welcoming and as open and as usable and inclusive as possible. So that's what we did. But then we were also talking about, well, active learning is great, group work, mm, but the noise. Uh, I can tell you that this building is amazing. So that was so much work. And Nicola would be able to tell you about it. So much work went on into to get the acoustics right. And it is amazing because you are, you can be in the middle of the building and you're not overwhelmed by noise. But then in the spaces where we have the really the, the group working spaces with really active spaces with teal, et cetera, you know, technology in there. And then we were thinking, well, that's great for most students. But what if somebody becomes quite overwhelmed? What if somebody feels like this is too much? I need some quiet space. And all of those rooms now have little nooks where you can sit a bit quieter, but where you can also work with your group a bit quieter. So, uh, and this here is the, the photo of the not quite finished, massive lecture theater. Um, and it's remarkable because when you stand in the front and the whole thing is opened up, so this sky wall is opened up, you can see every single seat. But the students as well, when you're in the seats, can see everybody. It doesn't feel claustrophobic as, as it 
tends, tended to, I remember the old lecture theatres, the old kind of amphitheatre-style uh, theatres, when if you felt claustrophobic because you felt like you were squeezed in, it's not like that at all. And um, as you might be able to see here with the stacking, there's a lot of space in between. So when you're teaching, you can walk through and you don't have to squeeze, but also the student, as I mentioned before, so this student can turn around and easily talk to that student. So there are ways of getting students to work together, work with peers in a lecture theatre. So I wanted to add those ones as well, just like Nicola, it's just nice to see some photos. And I really did like that by Kara Makara because the sun's shining and you can see how it streams into through the glass. It's a lovely and welcoming space. It was actually even better than I expected. So having worked on it for so long, the first time I was there and it was full and you've got the students there, it felt like, yes, this is a space to learn. This is a space where all three areas come together. And I put this one in to remind you of the, this afternoon session uh, and Vicky, my colleague Vicky, will be talking a lot about how we actually um, are tackling to make it happen that, the, that there is the support of the teaching transformation, which does include all the way, it goes all the way into curriculum design, uh, assessment, aligning, etc. So that's me. And I am now handing over to Liam. Thanks, Nick. Um, I don't have any slides, so everyone just has to look at my face for my head, so I only apologise. Um, but I started with the project formally in 2019 when I started in the SRC as Vice President of Education. So while I'd like to say I came in, dotted some I's, crossed some T's and take all the credit, as you can see so far, <laughs> it has been a massive project and there's just been so much that has gone into it. Um, but from the very start for me, I remember when I was considering running for my role, I asked my predecessor what the strangest thing about the job was. And they said they'd just come from a, a meeting where they were deciding on what chair would go in a building. Um, something you never really think that you're going to decide, you're going to have to work on when you go into student representation. But it shows the breadth of sort of areas that we ended up working on and that the university had, had us involved in. Um, I think, again, something that Nicola touched on, the key message for me was that students want Wi-Fi, plug sockets and coffee, and that was just to be reiterated at every meeting. That was my orders when I went in. Um, but at that point in the project, it was more about getting students on board. So the sabbatical officers were under an intense set of training and induction over the summer months when we start, just sort of for all aspects of university life. And part of this was a session with the estates colleagues to get us all up to speed with the entire campus development, which really allowed us to hit the ground running. And I think a really important part of that is that it wasn't just our education reps, it was the president, education, student, support and student activities. So it really was taking that holistic approach to the building that whilst learning and teaching is a big, big part of it, it was to make sure that students from sort of all walks of life and people representing those interests had a say in the direction of the building. Um, at the same time, sort of around me starting um, with the project, where I was beginning to work on the learning and teaching strategy. And me and my predecessor, we got to present at the away day on that to set the tone of the strategy. And I think that there as well really shows the student involvement that we had sort of at different parts of the university. But um, I really think the strategy does go hand in hand with what the building um, aims to do. And it really sort of sets the tone for the future of sort of learning and teaching at the university. and whilst the James McCune Smith is one part of that, it really does sort of have a ripple effect out with that, though wherever you are, it might not be in this brand new building, but that it really has transformed learning and teaching in all aspects of, of university life for us. Um, similar to that, um, we also had involvement at the class rep conference that um, the SRC run. So as Lauren said, we have about eight or 900 per year. So there was a proportion of that came to this conference and uh, had impact and sort of shared their views on many things. So the strategy was one of them, but we also had Karen, who I believe is speaking at the later session, come and share with students what sort of the vision was for the campus redevelopment. So uh, I think the one that sort of did get the most interest from students was the James McCune Smith because it was the one that was coming um, more recently, but 
it also really showed to us that sort of the idea of active learning wasn't just this top-down approach that it was it wasn't just senior leaders in the university saying oh, this is the future this is what we're going to do it really was coming from us that students wanted more and more of their learning experience and almost that the idea of just sitting in a lecture is is long gone that we really want to have to not have to but we really want to get that opportunity to sit with our peers and actually discuss the material that's being presented and not just have to to listen to a lecture speak for for an hour so it has been really reassuring for us at that stage that this wasn't just um something that we were doing and not taking into account the opinions of others but it really was something that was coming at us from all angles that this was really was what the future uh, of the university was going to be so that was quite nice for us um yeah so i think the one thing that came was apparent to me that was that it was vital for students to really have a seat at the table for these discussions um and we it was it was very reassuring that it wasn't just an afterthought it was you sort of in the door <laughs> in the door as a student rep and you were sitting on these high level meetings having these high discussions and i think lauren shared her fun fact from estates but the one that i took away was that escalators are the most efficient way of moving people through a building so uh we got more out of it <laughs> i think than we maybe put in sometimes but uh it really was a, a, a very successful relationship, I think. Um, but yeah, so we were involved from SAR and throughout the project, shaping an influence, not just, as I said, this the future of this building, but also policy and practice around learning and teaching that has just transcended the, the building itself. Um, we did sp speak on Monday at a pre-session about the role of strong leadership from university management and senior leaders in this, but. For me, as a student in the early days of the project, it was the impact of Lauren as a student leader when I was on council and she came to us and talked about this new building that there's going to be and oh, we're going to do this, this and this and really sold it to students. And I can only hope that I had the same impact on other students. So it really was, I think, a key role getting students on board, sharing with us the advantages of what this new direction was going to be. And then we translated that because we really did believe in it. And in all honesty, being a student now, I do get to reap the benefits of that. I have the privilege of experiencing this building as a student. And it's really interesting seeing something I worked on um, as plans and got a tour of an empty concrete building. So now sitting in the classroom, get, seeing all the behind the scenes work that went into it. But I think my favorite thing about the building now is seeing the personality it's gained. You, you start to see students cluster in different areas that they've all chosen to be their favorite. Um, and it's also somehow came around that the building has been nicknamed the Jimmy. So, uh, yeah, that is my job and for my experience on the building. But thank you very much for, for allowing me to share. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. And um, thank you, everybody. Um, I can see that we've got some questions in the Q&A and I can see that we're also be, we've been answering them. So thank you to the panel members for doing that. Uh, I'll come back to one or two of them. Just before I do, though, can I just say that there is somebody not on this call who was absolutely core to this project, and that's Professor Frank Colton, who was the sponsor for this project. He was the he had the learning and teaching portfolio at the time that I now have, and he's now our deputy vice chancellor. But it was his, I think it was his vision and his ability to kind of keep that focus and to really push us. So uh, Lauren and, and Liam both spoke about feeling a bit overwhelmed about being asked as a student what kind of spaces they would like and be involved in an estates project. They weren't the only ones. Um, when, when Frank asked me and another colleague, Dawn, to, to help lead the design of these learning, teaching and study spaces, we felt, we felt completely overwhelmed and, you know, really worried we would let everybody down. But it's been that, that team approach and working with our external partners, the architects, Steelcase and others, that's helped us build the confidence to do the things that we've done. But it was Frank who, who had that vision and I think I can't understate that. And I, I know one of the questions is about, you know, can you do this even if you don't have a new building? And, and I would say absolutely. It's about really being clear what is the educational ambition that you have? And, and Nick sp spoke really clearly about active learning for us. That was the ethos. That was what we wanted to do. We wanted to enable students to really engage in their discipline. And we know that they can do that so much better um, in these kind of collaborative environments. So as a research led institution, we wanted that active collaborative learning environment to permeate everything we did. But we've piloted, as others have mentioned, we've piloted spaces like this. So if you have a distributed campus, like one of the questions said, I would really encourage you to try different things and find out what works for you because 
although we learned from others, there were designs that other universities had that didn't work for us. We tried them in our pilot spaces and they just didn't work for us and our students. So, you know, what we've done, we, we believe is working for us, but it might not work in the same way for you. So if you have a space that you're refurbishing, it doesn't all have to be really expensive. It's just about giving that thought firstly to how you want your students to engage, how you want to support their learning, whether they're bringing their own devices, what kind of atmosphere you want to create, but crucially how you support colleagues to change their teaching practice, because just putting them in these rooms doesn't make them teach differently. And I know we're coming on to that this afternoon, uh, sorry, after, after this session. Um, so, so those things are really important, but it was that vision from the senior manager at the start that really kind of set the tone for this and, and made us stick to that the whole way through. Um, there is a question um, that I don't want to lose sight of from Andre um, about whether or not we are going to further transform these spaces to allow hybrid teaching. Um, so I think, Andre, you're using that term in the same way that we've been using that term, which is that you would have students in the same class uh, with some physically in a room and some joining remotely. Um, I might pass it to, to Dave and, and Nick in a second, but um, at the moment, we are not particularly advocating that approach. We are, of course, we're doing it to some extent because of the pandemic, but it's not one that we feel there's really quite the right technology to make that inclusive. And Nick's talked about how we really want the experience to be inclusive. So we, we don't want to do too much hybrid until we know students who are joining remotely really can engage as effectively as the students who are on campus. Um, where there are strategies for dealing with that in the short term, but but um, it's not a strategy that we are advocating as being core to our educational experience at the moment. Um, but Nick and Dave, I'll, I'll just turn to you in case there's something more that you would want to say, particularly in terms, Dave, of Andre's question, which is, you know, how would we transform, you know, would we have to do an awful lot in terms of technology? But Nick, I'll come to you first. Yes, so as, as Moira said, um, this is not one of our, this is not really the core of what we're doing, and, and, and it's not something that we really say, really advertise or is all that beneficial, because the reason why is not just for the students, but it is an extremely cognitive load for the teacher. So no matter what kind of technology is set up, and by the way, I'd recommend if you're interested in um, talking to a university that has been doing, you put a lot of work and investment in, it's Sydney University. So I can highly recommend them. They are very happy to, uh, to talk to you. But so, so then basically you would also then have to change um, the makeup of the staff, because I'm granted some of those, those um, really flexible and, and active areas require more than one teacher anyway. So you can't just have one person, you probably need others as well. But the moment you're talking about hybrid to not just forget about the ones that are online, but to really engage them in activities and potentially even in activities with the students that are in the physical space, there is absolutely no way you can do this with one person because it is you're so, so overwhelmed, you will lose sight of something and also you try to kill yourself. Um, and it's not beneficial to anyone, not to the students on campus, not to the students remote and not to the teacher. So you need to rethink, you need to have a teaching team um, and you also need to completely redesign really uh, what, how you actually and, and what you're teaching because you want students to be active. So you might be able to have activities with the students on campus, but also at the same time, the students online have an activity but do you know how many students you are going to have online, how many you are going to, have? and so on. So it's a very complex area. We are not really going down the route. We're doing things because we have to, but do talk to Sydney because they've really been investing in that. And Dave. Thanks, Nick. Um, so I think Nick's outlined the, the challenges in, in hybrid from a pedagogical um, approach setting out those spaces from a technical approach in some ways is relatively easy, but I, I think we recognised quite quickly that hybrid teaching isn't about presenting to camera and presenting to students in the room at the same time. It's much more involved and there's a, a significant change in approach that's required and it has to be interactive and it has to be engaging to meet our, our strategic objectives and to ensure that student experience that we're trying to, to make um, at the core of, of all of our planning and decision making. So going back to the question in terms of 
what we would need to do from a, a technical perspective. We do have a lecture recording. We had lecture recording before the pandemic. Um, it's become invaluable during the pandemic and will be a, a key part going forward for, for much of our, our delivery. How we do that in a, an active learning mode is something that we're, we're working through and, and developing. And it may be that the collaborative engaged activities that we're um, encouraging and that, that students have, have demonstrated that they want to be participating in, we use the, the flipped classroom approach where we, we record and then we, we engage in those activities. The challenge for us technically is how do we have collaboration and engagement with students who are in Glasgow and on campus and are able to work remotely and, and participate in, in group work with students who aren't on campus so that we have a an integrated cohort of students. That's something that, that we're working through from a, a software perspective, from a, a technical uh, technology in the room perspective, we would be looking to use what we have already um, with one eye on the future. I think that's that's what we've we've tried to put in place in the James McEwen Smith. And we will um, integrate with various different providers and, and cloud services to try and make that happen once we're sort of further down the line and defining where it is we want to get to with the with the, the teaching approach because it's all well and good having a technology solution if it doesn't fit the teaching approach it's not a solution so we, we need to uh, focus on the teaching side first. Thanks Dave. Um, I wanted to kind of come back a little bit Antoine, you've you've said that your question's been answered, and I can see people are still typing answers to that. But there's something in your question about the kind of distributed campus that I'd like to bring Nicola on, in on in a minute, um, because I think it also connects to Andre's question. Whatever we do, one of the challenges is for colleagues who we're trying to give a consistent experience to across the campus, and it's 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 great that we've been able to have a very consistent experience in this particular building. But across the campus, we have an array of rooms um, with, you know, um, IT setups that reflect um, not quite when they were, the rooms were created, obviously, but perhaps previous versions of our IT setup. Um, we don't have lecture capture uh, software in every space. We don't have the same lighting setup in every space. So sometimes for colleagues, when they run from room to room to room, that can be quite challenging. So. The design principles, I just would like to come back to them for a moment. We took, Nicholas shared the design principles that we adapted from McGill. We actually translated them into what that means for, you know, the lighting in the room, what that means for the kind of audiovisual IT setup. So when people go in, they have a roughly similar display setup, irrespective of the shape of the room. And so, Antoine, I would really say that being able to develop a shared understanding and a shared language and a shared sense of purpose and priority with your colleagues in estates and IT or however your institution is structured across these distributed um, buildings would be really important because that starts to give colleagues, academic colleagues and students confidence that you can change teaching practice. And, and for us, that's always been really important is we can't ask our colleagues to change what they do and to put all of the work into changing what they do to work in a collaborative environment if we then can't give them a space that works for that. So we've had to, and again, we'll talk about this more in the next session, but we've had to, to really try to coordinate that, but to work with colleagues and to really reassure them that we can have some baseline consistency across the campus. And I think we've still got some work to do on that, but, but translating those design principles through really helped. And I think in the pivot to online, it meant that we had a shared language and a shared understanding across these key parts of the university about what we meant by terms like active learning and so really that's that's like that's about keeping up conversations and trying to align different uh, the strategies from the different parts of the university but Nicola I'll, I'll maybe pass to you because I think I think this will be a challenge for probably everybody on the call to some extent yeah I mean we were very fortunate we had a site and um, we we had a capital budget and um, we delivered a building but the the, the James McGoon Smith is a fraction of our teaching estate and actually, day to day, huge swathes of our staff and students won't be taught in that building. So Moira's right, what we did was we took the principles and actually, you know, we, we've got the, the sort of full list of principles for each of the key themes, lighting, IT, accessibility, furniture, you know, look, feel, 
all of the sorts of things. But we also then sort of graded them. What was the bare minimum that we wanted to be able to achieve? And we have a five to 10 year program now. And, you know, we have a, a board or a, a group looking at refurbishment. And we're actually surveying all of our teaching rooms, looking at where interventions can be made to, to have the most impact, you know, where will, will it benefit the most people? And we're actually looking at what, what does a program of refurbishment look like over the next 10 years to get us from where we are now to a level of sort of parity of experience for everyone. And that, that doesn't mean that every space everyone walks into is going to be exactly the same because we will never achieve that. As Moira says, we have a very varied campus. I've got buildings that date from 1840. Um, I, I've got, you know, interwar buildings. I've got 1960s concrete buildings. So there are, there are limitations to what we can do. But where can we have a consistent level of experience, at, you know, that, that everyone, everyone experiences? And that, that's what we're working towards. But the JMS, it's amazing. It's fantastic. Um, but it's only a fraction of our teaching space. So really the challenge for us now is how do we make sure that everyone is getting a similar experience across the campus? And as, as David and Moira have said, there is nothing more stressful than walking into a room and not being able to find the on switch. Um, you know, and that, that's just horrendous. And instantly it sets the tone for the whole session. So if the only thing that we do across the entire campus is you know, make sure everyone has a comfortable seat and make sure the on switch is in the same place, then already we're, we're you know, we're moving us forward. I hope that answers that question. But we did, we did pilot a lot of spaces and we learned a lot from piloting things. We did one space in our School of Medicine. It was a teal space. It was active. It was, oh, it was just so much technology. Uh, and actually, after three minutes of being in the space, everyone had a headache and had to leave because we painted the walls red and orange and vibrant colours. And really, it was just awful. I mean, it was awful. And we learned so much from that mistake. So from all the good things that we've done, we've also learned a lot from all of the, the huge mistakes that we made. And, we, you know, we're, we're, we're happy with those mistakes because they took us a step forward on our journey. Thank you. I was I was trying to reply. I'm not very good at typing and listening and coordinating things at the same time. Um, I was trying to answer a question about um, our collaborator. So Nick has mentioned Sydney and provided a link. We did work a lot with McGill in Canada. And actually, McGill is a good example of a uh, university a bit like ours with lots of historic buildings um, where they did introduce active learning and have, again, approached that from an educational perspective. And we adopted their design principle of approach and adapted theirs to, to, to something that worked for us. But um, I'm wondering if any of my colleagues from um, either academic and digital development or student learning development who are, who are involved in this today could, could find the video. Um, we had Adam Finkelstein from McGill give a talk at our annual learning and teaching confer conference about what they have done in McGill. And he talked about the evidence base for the merits, educational merits of active learning but also the kind of improvements they've seen in student attainment as a consequence of adopting that approach. Um, and so he gives a really nice narrative. It's about an hour long video keynote session. If you're interested, we'll, we'll try and track down that video. I'm pretty sure we have a YouTube link. We can pop into the chat if you would like to, to see that. Um, I know we have another sort of 15 minutes or so for, for questions and I'm, I'm scrolling through trying to make sure I don't miss any. I'm, I'm aware that there are some about exams. I'm going to, to come to that at the end, if that's okay, once we've covered all of the ones that relate to the building. But I did want, there was a question about lecture recording um, that I have now lost. I read it and I can't now find it, but the question I think was, do we require all of our um, teaching staff to record their lectures or can they opt out? So we used to have a an opt-in policy and we changed that actually just before the pandemic to an opt-out policy and we have a range of reasons as to why lectures might not be recorded but actually one of them is that the more active they are <laughs> the less suitable they are for recording because you can imagine a scenario some of our large flat floored spaces hold several hundred students um, who could be working who are working in groups Nick showed a picture of, of one of those spaces with the group tables 
um, it, it just wouldn't work to record that. So I think we're, we're having to rethink what, what, are, what is the type of digital resource that is supportive for students. If somebody is standing giving a lecture or, or doing that live on, on Zoom, actually there's been a, a considerable uptake in the number of people who do that and we can auto schedule that into our own campus classes. Um, but actually for a lot of the learning design that we're talking about, the lecture recording policy doesn't really apply in the same way not least because we would also then get into the territory of, of needing students' consent for their recorded input to be shared online. So we've, we've had to keep revising our policy, actually, to try and keep it up to date with the way in which the, the world has been changing. Um, so I just thought it might be, be worthwhile picking up on that for a minute or two. Or I saw that there was a, a question in the chat about um, how, how do you deal with an architect who has another vision of the oh, okay. project and I thought that was interesting so so we went through a really detailed process um of of procurement of the architectural team the design team and we spent a lot of time getting to know them uh, before we made our decision about who we wanted to to come and be part of our sort of collaborative venture and so I think that the work that you do at the start of any project like this um, absolutely reaps the benefits as you go into to the more detailed part. And we, we chose an architect who A, had experience of learning and teaching in higher education, but B, who wanted the client's involvement um, and who, who didn't see it just as a sort of a transactional relationship, who genuinely wanted to learn from us as much as we wanted them to, to you know to learn from them and so I, I think spending that time at the start and um, us being very clear in articulating what we wanted and we didn't speak about a building we spoke about the activities so a building is really just uh, if there's any architects on the call I apologize already a building is just a box in which to house things and we were clear about that from the start. Don't show me any pretty designs. Don't show me any features or walls. Not interested. What we were interested in from the get go was what activities are we going to support here in this space? And how will these spaces work together? Um, and that, that was key. We, we do have very, quite complex governance, you'll be surprised to hear in our university. Um, so we have court who oversee everything, but the way that the university has set up running all of these sort of individual capital projects is, as Moira mentioned, we have a sponsor and then we have a board which brings in all the different disciplines. So the students, the, the academics, IT, estates, we're all together and collectively we are driving forward the design and then the delivery of the project and actually that, that sort of shared accountability meant that we were all very, very engaged. But the one thing that I would say is we, we didn't underestimate the time that people would need to be able to do creative thinking and work together. And we also didn't underestimate the fact, and Lauren and Liam have both said, we were bringing people into a world that is mine and I, am, I, I love my world, but we were bringing people into a world that they weren't particularly familiar with and that we had to genuinely give the time and the support to get everybody to a sort of a common level of understanding. Um, surveyors love acronyms, so do academics right enough, but you know, we had to find this common language to work together. And the time that we put in at the start of the project doing that absolutely reaped the benefits as we went on the journey. So just a quick answer to that question. Yeah, and, and I think you know, Nicola has mentioned this, but just a little bit more on the kind of governance and governing body. Our governing body, the University Court that Nicola mentioned, you know, they, they are so key in, in decision making um, and really helping them understand where we were going in terms of the overall campus is, is one part of that, but, but helping them think rethink what educational change means and the time frame for that is, is also really important because you know, these things can't always change quickly when we're redesigning, Nicole mentioned, um, you know, aligning assessment and learning outcomes, you know, that that's not something you just do overnight. These are a reframing of how we teach and how we engage students that we need to do over time. So all of that has come into the discussion and, and Liam talked about the learning and teaching strategy. We developed that during the pandemic, actually, but it's allowed us to build on a lot of the pandemic work and to incorporate everything we've discussed today into that longer term um, 
direction, but it links to a question <clears throat> um, that Julius has asked about how do we, essentially how do we prepare students for, for working in these spaces in the way that we had intended. So we've talked about staff and how we need to support staff in changing how they teach. We also need to support students in, in adapting how they learn and how they engage with these new ways of, of learning. And so actually the next session, we're going to talk about that. So um, Scott and Andrew both work as part of the team who work with students um, and offer a lot of that um, central support. So they're going to discuss that more fully because you're absolutely right. We can't just, um, it's one thing to have students intuitively use a building. It's another thing for them to be supported in learning differently and thinking differently about how they work with their colleagues. But it's really important to, as Nicola said right at the start, that they have the opportunity to develop the sorts of skills they will be expected to, to, to use in the workplace and the chance for them to work with students um, both in their private study and in classes is something that we've we've not been able to do in all of our campus just because of the way that that it's been um, the, the way that the, some of our teaching spaces have been set up so um, we are really trying to work with the student body on that um, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more in the next session. Um, I'm just trying to make sure if anybody thinks that we've missed any of the questions about the building or the active learning. Um, the only thing I was going to add, sure Myra, Nick's already said it, that, you know, how do we ensure students are using the building correctly? Um, I, I actually think the the design supported that uh, and of course there's there's how are they engaging with the, the teaching but actually how are, how are they you know how are the behaviors in the building and we were very keen that there wouldn't be signs everywhere you know with the, the circle and the cross across it for you know you must be quiet in this space or you must not do that or we really wanted people to take ownership but through some of the design we um we gave that sort of supported different types of behavior. So for example, on one floor in the building, um, and it's the only floor, the study space is glassed in. And that for us is, that's the focused, really quite silent study space. And the furniture in that space is much more individualized. You know, people are very much, you know, focused and, and sort of studying by themselves rather than the more sort of group support space study furniture. And again, in that space, and it's, it's interesting, Liam mentioned the escalators, but the escalators bypass that space because you genuinely have to have made the effort to use the stairs or the lift to get to that level. So just little things through design, we tried to support different behaviours in different areas of the building so that we didn't have to have people going around telling people to be quiet or, you know, that this is sad. We didn't really want laminated signs everywhere that that was the thing that we tried to resist as strongly as possible was a plethora of laminated signs and so through the design we've managed to just give those cues to the different types of behaviors for example in the in the, the ground floor catering space we didn't put sockets because actually we didn't want people sort of um, table blocking, you know, I've, I've gone in at nine and I'm just going to sit there all day with my laptop. Uh, and uh, because that is actually the social engaged, you know, coming together in fellowship space. So we didn't, we chose not to put sockets there so that people would then have to move on to recharge and blah, blah, blah. And again, just these little subtle um, design cues kind of have supported really, really great behaviours throughout the entire building. Can I just pick up on that briefly, Moira, just to mm -hmm. say, I think it, it really is in that design that you see the way that students use the space. I think, as Nicola said earlier, as we move forward, you know, each year a new cohort will come in and they will think this building has been there for forever. And but they will also learn to use the building in the way that works for them. And the space is flexible enough that students really can use the space. I have gone in there on numerous occasions to meet colleagues or to meet students and seen students interacting in the same spaces with the same furniture, but in totally different configurations doing completely different activities. And I think it's that, it's that flexibility being built into the space, but also with those subtle cues, as Nicola said, around trying to direct behavior by 
the space that you create. Um, and I think that's really important that it, there's no clear prescriptive way of using the space, but there are cues that facilitate students using the space in the way that it was intended. And it's, it's really, I think, rewarding to see the ways that students use the spaces now and how innovative they can be in the way that they use spaces, ways that we didn't even envisage they might use that space. Um, and I think that's what's been really great in seeing the building come to life is, is really it's the students building and they, they shape how that building is used. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I think that we have gone through all of the questions, except for Robin's questions about exams, which I'll just address briefly before we come to, to the end, because we're due to finish in just two or three minutes. Um, so, Robin, how are we dealing with digital online exams and what's our future plan? I, we could probably take another 45 minutes to talk through that because there are so many different aspects of that question, which I suspect you are also working through, otherwise you wouldn't have asked this question. Um, in relation to this building, actually, it's one of the few buildings that could potentially host what we would say digital exams on campus. So when students bring in their own device, because we have much more power in these spaces, if we were to host more um, kind of bring your own device, either invigilated or uninvigilated online exams, that's much more difficult to do elsewhere on the campus because we don't have that pervasive um, access to power at that kind of scale for students to use. But we are, we are currently trying to work through our strategy for the future of exams whilst also addressing the fact that we remain um, operating within a pandemic. So we are going to have a combination this spring our exams start in April and May, our exams start in April and go into May, we will have a combination with some exams on campus and we have quite specific criteria for, for those and, and why we would hold those exams on campus, but many more exams online, not least because not all of our students manage to travel to, to, to Glasgow, so we need to make sure that we assess students on a course in, in the same way. So we have a kind of arrangement at the moment and then we're working through our longer term um, strategy so that you know there's we're looking both at student well-being and academic integrity but also I would go back to to something Nick said this is about redesigning learning and teaching and assessment and so we we are really trying hard to work with colleagues to think about what does assessment of active learning look like what are better ways of assessing students where is there a role for exams and where are there other options um, I think some have found it very challenging with all of the pressures of the last couple of years to, to develop that thinking as far as they would like. But um, we are trying to, to work with colleagues to, to, to be sensitive to the different disciplines and the way those disciplines teach and assess, but at the same time to progress the conversation about assessment. And we've talked about inclusive learning. We have a, a strategy for inclusive assessment. So quite, quite some big questions about what that means. So Robin, I, I haven't answered your question in detail, but I hope I've expressed the approach that we're taking and what we're trying to take into account. Um, so in just the last minute, I'm going to say thank you so much for, for the questions and for the very positive feedback in the chat. Um, we're due to take a break for 45 minutes now, and then we will have a second session where um, colleagues will talk about how we're supporting academic colleagues to change their teaching practice, to redesign, their learning and teaching for these new spaces and the incremental ways in which we want to support that move, not to just from tra to translation, but transformation of teaching and how we're supporting students. And I, I really hope that um, you'll come back and join us for that part of the workshop. Thank you very much. I don't know whether Ian is coming back in at this point or quite what we're um, doing. I, <laughs> sorry, I've, uh, I've just uh, written in the chat that I'm really looking forward to, to the afternoon. I think it's been a really inspiring morning um, and I really just want to thank you for, for the really thoughtful way in which you and your colleagues have really talked, not just about what has worked really well, but also about the mistakes that you've learned from, because I think that's always I think sometimes the hardest in our sector to kind of really be upfront about, um, but actually the, the fact that actually in, in thinking about these projects, we really need to learn from our experience, good and bad, is I think a really uh, important message, as is the message that it's really important to talk to each other and to talk to each other with institutions 
wherever they are around the world, but are in different contexts, because we can always really learn something uh, from them and take that uh, back on our own journey. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, th I, I, I found it really, really um, inspiring. So, and I really look forward uh, to this afternoon's uh, uh, proceeding of this afternoon's workshop. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, everyone. And we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, it's 12 o'clock in UK time, so one o'clock in Central uh, European time. So I'm going to begin the second session for our seminar. Thank you so much for coming back to join us. Um, we have a slightly different panel for this session, and I appreciate that it may be that some of you have joined who weren't in the first session. So I'm going to um, do a little bit of introduction. Um, before we start, including introducing myself and maybe just a word or two about what happened in the previous session for those who have joined us afresh, and then we'll start with our input as intended. So, um, good afternoon. I'm Moira Fishbacher Smith. I'm the Vice Principal for Learning and Teaching at the University of Glasgow, and I'm going to ask my colleagues to introduce themselves in the order in which they'll contribute in a few moments. So, Nick, I'll turn to you first of all. Yes. Good afternoon, just in case you weren't there in the earlier one. Uh, I'm Nick and I'm the Deputy Director, Academic and Digital, Digital Development, and I lead that team. And uh, Vicky is uh, one of the esteemed colleagues in that team, so you're here from her later. And um, we sit in the University of Glasgow, uh, we sit in academic services, so we are kind of a combination of uh, well, academics, but also a service, as you would assume, education developers across the world are. So that's just a little bit from me. Thanks, Nick. Vicky. Hi, everyone. So I'm Vicky Dale. Um, as Nick said, part of the academic and digital development team. My role is an academic and digital development advisor. Um, so I've spent a huge proportion of my, my career supporting people on how to use technology enhanced learning and teaching appropriately. Um, but obviously, um, you can't just do technology in isolation. I think Jan made that point earlier this morning that, you know, digital isn't the, the whole kind of way that we're going. So we have to think about our on campus experience as well and obviously when we think about the appropriate use of technology we can think about that in the context of an active blended learning um, capacity so I'll be talking to you about how we support staff to engage in, in using not just technology appropriately um, but also technology in the context of, of active learning and the wider active learning pedagogies thanks thanks Vicky Scott hi thanks I'm Scott Ramsey I'm or <laughs> Until very recently, I was the good practice advisor, which I always think is a job title that doesn't tell you what the advice is about or what field I work in. So it was good practice in the context of learning and teaching. So I, I would collect, curate and disseminate examples of good teaching practice through things like um, speaking to colleagues uh, to find those, but also coordinating uh, until recently the university's learning and teaching conference and our CPD series. So that's that's the angle I'm coming at this from today. Thanks, Scott. And, and just to say that you were also very involved in the decisions around the teaching spaces that we talked about in the previous session. Andrew. Hey, I'm Andrew Stroon. Um, I manage the team of effective learning advisors or learning developers that tends to be the, the, the kind of title of those types of folks now. Um, and we work across all students from undergraduates all the way through um, to teach students the academic literacies, academic abilities and academic skills that they need to have in order to be able to succeed in their studies. So I'll be talking today around about the types of things that we've done um, to work with and alongside students and with and alongside academic staff as we change practices. Thanks, Andrew. So there are the colleagues who are going to be making the kind of presentational input or talking through their roles, but we also have Karen here with us for this session and Karen and I are going to support with the questions and also Karen's here in case there are particular questions around estate. So Karen, if you would like to also introduce yourself, please. Thanks. Um, my name is Karen Lee. I'm part of the estates team. I've got particular responsibility for uh, space management and planning around teaching spaces. Uh, and then for timetabling the use of those. So I'd spend a, quite a lot of time working with academic colleagues and colleagues on this call um, about how we provision for the future and the things that we need to be taking account of and how we can do things differently. Thanks, Karen. 
just before we start, for the benefit of anybody who's just joined us, I'm sorry, I just accidentally muted myself there. Um, we spent the first session really talking about the vision, the ambition and the educational aim behind what we were trying to achieve with the new building. But um, I hope it was clear that it was really not just about the, the new building, but it was about really trying to transform education. And a huge part of that has been working with our students and our academic colleagues for a number of years now to support them in changing teaching practice. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, to Nick in a moment or two. Um, she's going to do a little bit of a recap on one or two key points from this morning just um, that she felt would be important for anyone who had missed that. But but um, it's just a short recap before she, she starts um, to talk a little bit more about the, the context for how we were working with colleagues. So um, I will hand over to Nick and as before I will try and keep an eye on the Q&As and pick up on any that come up during our presentational component but up, we may leave some until we're doing the, the broader Q&A at the end. So Nick, over to you, thank you. Yes, just a few slides, I'm trying to keep it short, but I do feel for, for anybody who wasn't here earlier, um, really, I did, one of the most important key points was that um, the change of teaching and more potentially the change of learning, of course, that goes along with the teaching as well, was driven by students and staff. And that's why, in this session, you'll have people from the student learning development and people from the academic and digital development team uh, talking to you. And um, I said that earlier, and uh, I still like it, even though it still might sound a little bit OTT, but it's not just a building to us, it's a philosophy. It's much more than a brick and mortar. Well, actually, I'm not quite sure how much brick and mortar is in there. Um, so, something else to bear in mind. And um, what we are about and what the building is about is active learning. And therefore it might well be that students also have to learn how to engage in active learning. And I say I might well be, well, I'll leave that to Andrew and uh, Scott. And I mentioned those before, and that is the way we started out thinking about uh, the spaces and the physical space is not just a physical space. Um, active learning very often means uh, blended learning. So therefore part of that is the technology. So you, have, you need um, to come together in the physical space, the online or technological space, but also the mental space. It's very important, and there's been so much research done on that, that students need to have the right environment to actually be open and able to learn. So we're looking at all of that together in the zone. And no, I just call it like that. Um, I was really trying to, to come up with a perfect word for it, but I don't think it's there. So um, yeah not just active learning. And I just wanted to kind of end with the importance of inclusive active learning, because you might very well have, and we do actually have other potential issues uh, with inclusivity. The moment we start really going into active learning and peer learning, collaborating, um, and we need to think about that. And just like the building, Everything we do, everything, how we approach it is about inclusivity. It's the assessment, it's teaching, it's learning, it's the environment, it's the online one. And all of that means there's a positive mental space for students to engage with learning, but of course also for staff. So I'm just handing over now to my colleague, Nikki. Thanks, Nick. That's great. That set the scene really nicely for what we're going to talk about. I'm just going to um, share my screen now, so bear with me just for a second. And hopefully you can see that slide OK. Um, so this is our, our vision for active learning spaces. And Moira's obviously talked about the, the overarching vision earlier on. Um, I made some notes while I was thinking about preparing this. And so I may refer to some of my notes from time to time. But some of the things that I've written down um, were things like partnership. And I think that's come across really clearly throughout the whole morning. So partnership with staff at all levels, across all areas, partnership with students. 
Um, good practice as well, and I know Scott's going to be talking a lot more about good practice later on, but good practice, um, identifying good practice and um, sharing good practice is something that's really important. Um, obviously, we're, we're doing that today, um, but we do that within our own institution as well. And we're really privileged to have a huge number of academic staff who are just excellent at what they do and are really passionate about learning and teaching. And then I'm going to touch a tiny little bit on evaluation as well, because I think it's important that we don't just capture the successes, but also the challenges. And I think, you know, as other people listening in to us today, you won't be, you know, we're not going to present something shiny and everything's perfect. Um, th this is a constant process and, and we learn from, from how things are going and we, we need to record, you know, what, what are people struggling with? What do people need extra support with? And then the other point I've written down is that um, what's really key to this uh, sort of succeeding with this vision is having supportive leadership at all levels. So obviously Moira's um, driven this, this vision forward in her capacity as vice principal for learning and teaching, but we've also had um, a lot of leadership from Professor Frank Colton as well. Um, and so I think that without that leadership, we wouldn't be able to do what we're all doing at the staff and student levels. Um, so I think that's really, really critically important. Uh, okay, so some of the things I wanted to talk about then, I'll just um, bring up my slides. Yeah, so, so one key thing really is our University of Glasgow strategy. So, so Moira's obviously led on that, and that's something that we've all had an opportunity to feed into as staff or students. Um, and there's three pillars of that strategy, and I think they're very relevant in this context in terms of supporting staff to engage with active learning. So the first pillar is student-centered learning. Um, and essentially we know that we need to prepare um, independent self-directed learners um, who are capable of, of, of having that self-efficacy, um, of being able to solve problems in collaboration with other learners. So the, the curriculum is, is more and more focused, all the curricula for the University of Glasgow are becoming more and more focused on enabling students to be those, what we term at Glasgow as world changers, you know, world changers welcome. We want them to solve real world problems. And so a lot of the transforming the curricula activity is about redesigning curricula to enable students to become those world changers, to become those problem solvers. Um, so real world problems are really critical to that too, but we also have things going on like flexible pathways into courses, you know, there, there's a role of, um, you know, massive online open courses or micro credentials and so on, work related learning, so it doesn't all just happen in the classroom, what happens in the classroom is really critically important, but it's not just, it's, it's, only, it's just one part of the overarching um, curricula. And the other part that's really critical in this context of active learning is this whole idea of skills development. So we refer to them as graduate attributes, but you often hear the terms transferable skills or soft skills. Um, and so, you know, critical thinking emerges as, as a key skill here. But we also have things like digital literacies and um, data literacies, enterprise and innovation. So all of these three strands, I think, form the foundation for what we're trying to do for active learning and teaching um, in terms of supporting staff to enable students um, to be those world changers. And so what do we do to enable staff? So there's, there's three things that we're doing at the moment. Um, so pedagogical support, and there's a number of ways that we do that. And I've got another slide that, that goes into some of the strategies we use for that. Um, but we want staff to I guess, kind of expand their toolbox of learning and teaching methods. You know, I think it was, um, I think it was, uh, oh gosh, uh, Nicola was, was quoting Moira when she said, it's transformation we're looking for and not translation. So I think the kind of, the, the hope was that people wouldn't just simply take their existing teaching practices and translate them into this new space, but actually think, you know, how could, how could this space, how could it really facilitate an exciting form of learning and teaching that engaged our learners, that, that helped them develop all the skills that we want, as well as having that robust content knowledge and, and um, the ability to apply that knowledge. Um, and so we've been talking people through, for example, um, different pedagogies. So we already have a lot of staff doing a lot of wonderful stuff. Um, but even things like sharing 
methods with them, like think peer share is a really basic method, um, towards perhaps more active pedagogy. So we've got jigsaw classroom, which is still quite teacher centered in the sense that the teacher specifies the task and um, the students move around and they go into one group and then they, they sort of work together and then come back to the original group and share that knowledge. Um, but then we've got more student centered methods. So team based learning, for example, we have a number of experts in the Adam Smith Business School, for example, who are doing a lot with team based learning um, as a specific pedagogy. We've got the scale up pedagogy. Um, and in some cases, we've, we've kind of, you know, we talked about visiting um, other campuses and things before. So we visited places like Leeds and we visited Nottingham Trent University. And they're all doing really good things around active learning as well. Anglia Ruskin University is another good university for doing active learning work. Um, but for example, you know, the, the pedagogical benefits of using something like um, team-based learning or scale up. Um, we, we had hard evidence from colleagues at these other universities that it really enhances the student experience. And importantly, what it does is it closes the attainment gap between um, traditional learners and non-traditional learners. So we're really trying to, um, in terms of that pedagogical support, it's not just a textbook, how do you do this, but what is actually best practice? What's, what's coming out of discussions with the overall sector? Where's the evidence that actually transforms learning and enables that critical thinking and enables students to actually perform better in their assessments? Um, so so that's, that's, I guess, the, the pedagogical support, which I'll go into in a bit more detail shortly. Um, and then we've got the audiovisual support. So Dave already mentioned this morning that, um, you know, there needed to be consistency across the campus. There needed to be consistency in terms of how the control panels worked so that um, staff weren't thrown by technology, for example. Um, and there's also a lot of support in the, the rooms themselves. So there's QR codes where if people run into trouble, they can quickly scan that QR code and immediately get help from someone. Um, there, there's lots of um, printed documentation affixed to the, the lecterns as well. Um, and I think one of the important things that the audiovisual team did, and that this was Joe Tinkler and his colleagues, um, one of the, the very effective things that they did at the beginning was actually handholding with academic staff. So before um, they started teaching, Joe and his colleagues would take them around, show them the equipment and be on hand, you know, when they were delivering teaching in that first space, because I think it was quite daunting for staff. Um, so it's not just the pedagogy and it's not just how to teach, but it's also feeling comfortable in that space. And I think that's a key message that comes across for staff and students is feeling comfortable in the space. And part of that is knowing how the audiovisual technology works and keeping that simple. Um, and then another thing I think worth mentioning is the ongoing evaluation of staff experiences. Um, and so I, I did some, I, I would call it a quick and dirty evaluation with some academics. It wasn't a kind of scholarly study. It was a quick and dirty kind of um, evaluation of how things are going, what's working well, are your expectations being met? Um, you know, what challenges are you encountering? And I think one of the, the key messages that came across from that was the space. You know, when people walked into the space, it was the feel of the space. It was big, it was bright, it was airy. It's so many possibilities. Um, and I think as well, probably because of the pandemic, there was a sense in which people hadn't really made full use of the space as they would like to. So for example, we've got, we've got throwable microphones that you can throw from one end of the room to the other. There, there's um, little individual writing boards and things. And I think people were frightened to touch anything during the pandemic for obvious reasons. So I think that the, the full capacity of the space hasn't really been used yet. And I think, so the evaluation needs to be ongoing and you know, are people's expectations being met? Are they able to do everything that they want to do? Um, and so on. So, so that's just our vision, really. It's enabling our staff, um, but it's in line with the University of Glasgow strategy. And I, I'm not keeping an eye on the um, questions at this point um, in the Q&A, but if there are any questions, um, I'll come back to them. And Moira, please feel free to interrupt me if there's anything. I will, and don't worry, I'm keeping an eye. <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay, so this is one of the spaces here. Um, you've seen a lot of photos of the spaces. I think 
one critical thing was when the spaces were being designed, we had to think how would the different pedagogies work in these spaces. So we've got different shapes of tables, we've got different numbers of chairs around the tables, we've got um, different types of screens and individual whiteboards and so on. Um, I remember at meetings, one of the things that um, I, I think um, became almost a joke was the fact that I said, we need to have a scale up room, we need to have a scale up room so that staff can learn to use this particular methodology. Um, and this isn't a photo exactly of that space, but it's a similar space where we've got round tables and the scale up technique students work in groups of three. They've got different roles and um, typically in three groups of three around a table. And then they exchange information about their, the problem they're solving with the other groups and then they can share it to the class. So it's almost like a version of think, pair, share. But, you know, we had to think about the, the furniture and how does that support these types of technologies? And another thing is, you know, how do we support staff going into these spaces? It was actually quite nice walking into the spaces because on paper it looked huge. The biggest rooms, they, they looked massive and daunting. And, you know, we had meetings with, with first year coordinators that I'll talk about in a second. And, um, you know, they, they were they were really quite daunted. You mean, you mean the, the lectern's over here, but we're going to be standing over here and walking round about. Um, and so some staff are really comfortable with that. They're, they're really comfortable getting in amongst the students and, and working with them and supporting them. And other staff, you know, particularly new staff, might lack confidence to leave the, the lectern or the podium. That, that's a kind of place of safety almost. Um, so, so that's just one of the spaces. And then we've got another space here. So Nick was talking about accessibility being really important. We've got height adjustable um, you know, table edges here um, that are standard throughout the whole building for these types of tables. Um, but again, you've got um, you've got a kind of staff lectern over here. So that's where the, the staff member would put their, their, their bags and their papers and so forth down. But you can see that the already in between classes that the chairs are all huddled around the teacher's um, table. So they've obviously come up to, to, to get some advice and, and support um, from them. And then I just wanted to talk about the lecture theatre a little bit because, you know, one of the things that Frank Colton said was, he said, this is going to be the last lecture theatre that the university will ever build. And, and I don't know if that's true, Moira. I, I, you know, I don't know if that's going to be realised in, in the longer term. Um, but his vision really was that we shouldn't be doing the didactic forms of teaching. And so you can see at the moment that the, 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 um, the seats are all facing front. Um, but they are on movable wheels. So staff can turn these round. As Nick said, you can walk among the, the different rows in between them and you can turn around the students and, and put them into groups and, and really focus on that kind of discussion. So um, it is a lecture theatre, but, but it's not a lecture theatre. The idea is that it is more student centred, that it is more participatory. Um, it's interesting. I think it was... Um, you know, it was Nicola was talking about, you know, that this kind of assumption that, that the janitorial staff would say, well, do we need to put the room back again eh, the way it should be? Because because everything needs to be tidy. Everything needs to be seats facing the way that they should be. And I think that was always one of the frustrations of some of the existing spaces on campus was that you would go in and, and a room that that had the potential to, to support more student centred learning was actually put tidily back at the end of the end of the day. And I think the idea was that this is a flexible space. It shouldn't be tidily put back. You know, it should be, this is this is a place where learning happens and it, the room shouldn't dictate um, what happens in terms of learning and teaching. It should help facilitate that student-centered engagement. So I just wanna talk briefly about some of the work with academic staff. So I'm just gonna do a shout out here to Dr. Joseph McGuire, who is here teaching some of these computing science students. This is actually in a former technology enhanced active learning space in the, well, it still exists in the medical school, but this is one of the kind of precursors for the new building. And, and Joe is just um, so enthusiastic about teaching in this spaces, as well as several other of our staff who are really our champions. And I think we couldn't do what we do without our early adopters really enthusing everyone and, and sharing good practice. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all of them really. In terms of the work with academic staff, we started with first year coordinators, and this is something that Moira was very keen on, um, for obvious reasons that when you're introducing change to a curriculum, 
we know from previous experiences that if you try and introduce change, like, you know, an element of collaborative learning or cooperative learning into an existing curriculum, it's an add on. And so students will be really resistant to do something that they, they don't normally do. Um, staff will be, um, you know, they, they will be constantly fighting a battle, I think, to try and introduce change. That's the experience I've had in the past in different roles, is that when you try and introduce um, student-centred active learning onto an existing curriculum, you will encounter resistance because the, you all know that, that curricula are overcrowded. There's just so much information people feel the need to cover. You know, people have got developed these curricula over years. There's a need to start at ground level and say, OK, how are, how are these first year courses going to, to shape themselves? And how is that going to be, um, you know, how are you going to build on that throughout the whole programme? So there's an element when you're thinking about curriculum design, not just of what's happening in one particular course, but what's happening across the whole programme. And how do you scaffold um, students' ability to engage in active learning and independent collaborative learning from day one. So we had meetings with the first year uh, course coordinators um, and they were held by college and, and that was really just a conversation about let's have a look at these rooms. We had all these beautiful rooms and the plans. Let's have a look. What could you do in this space? Which of these courses would lend themselves well to these spaces? Are your staff, um, are you doing anything that would lend itself well? So you know, Karen will talk later on about, you know, timetabling, but we had to give priority to people who wanted to introduce active learning from the outset and who were prepared to change their teaching. So again, coming back to that idea of transformation, not translation. We also had what we called active learning at scale workshops, where we brought in people from different schools. Um, these were the typically first year um, coordinators as well with the rest of their teaching team. And we brought them in to one of the technology enhanced active learning spaces in the, the education building and just got them to think, you know, what is active learning? What does it mean to you? Um, what active learning practice are you already engaging in? Um, what support do you need? What, what, what's your blue sky curriculum? What does that look like? And we brought in librarians and learning technologists and we had colleagues from student learning development all to help kind of, you know, share ideas and get people thinking. Um, and unfortunately, soon after that, the, the pandemic hit and kind of disrupted some of those conversations, um, which obviously we're, we're looking to get back on track. But we wanted to engage not just first year coordinators, but all staff. So Scott will talk a little more about um, continuing professional development. And one of the, the CPD events that we ran was actually in the active learning space, because there's nothing to be getting in that space and getting your hands on the technology. And so we sought to emulate good practice. And basically staff were set up in groups and we gave them a group work task and we got them sharing the, the sort of um, their kind of you know, solution on the screen and then projecting it to the bigger screen so that they could see how that would use being in the student seat, they could see how that would then work um, from a teacher perspective. Um, so CPD, so that was one aspect of CPD, but then, um, you know, there's a whole range of different, um, you know, active learning type uh, events and CPD happening that the good practice um, advisor is organising as well. Um, another thing that we did was, um, it's called ALPS, Active Learning Practice and Scholarship. So we're trying to, to use the acronym to, to get people thinking, you know, what's, what's our vision? What, what, what's the, the peak of, of, of our dreams, I guess, in terms of, of active learning? And that's just a, it's a, a professional learning community where people can share experience. We can highlight, you know, relevant readings to people. And we can signpost different events, external events and so on. Um, another initiative, um, I, think, I can't remember who said it was that, that people liked their acronyms, we do like our acronyms in education, um, is a supporting active learning and teaching working group. So this is to identify, you know, what staff resources do we have, what, what student resources do we have and what staff and student resources do we need to build. And another strand of that activity was also um, how do we support staff on an ongoing basis in terms of their scholarship and so on. Um, we've got strong engagements with the Active Learning Network, which is an international organisation. Um, universities such as Southampton Solent, um, Anglia Ruskin University, they're very active in there as well. There's a global active learning festival coming up um, later this month. 
And so um, we engage with them as well. And it's an opportunity because we're a, a University of Glasgow satellite group. And um, we have the opportunity for our staff to engage with that wider network to share their expertise, but also um, learn from others in that, that global network too. Um, so if people are interested in active learning, I would suggest you have a look at the active learning network. Um, there's also things like the Learning and Teaching Development Fund um, and staff are encouraged to think about, you know, the key pillars of the, of the, the learning and teaching strategy. Um, they're encouraged to experiment, their staff-student partnership, but a lot of that's around active learning in all its different forms as well. So it's a multi-pronged approach, I would say. Um, we've also got things like um, for early career staff, we've got the postgraduate certificate in academic practice. Um, so I've got that twice, academic practice. Um, that's led by Dr. Michael McEwen, and we've got 13 courses on that programme. And I would say that there's potential to investigate active learning in relation to people's individual practice on all of these courses. So while all of the courses may not be explicitly labelled active learning, I think active learning is as a key, um, you know, it's a key foundation for, for that whole programme, really. And then there's Teaching Excellence Network events, and they're run by my colleague Janice Davidson. Um, and there have been some active learning events there. And that's for people who are teaching award winners and teaching excellence award winners, and also people who have um, seen your fellowship of the Recognising Excellence in Teaching Scheme, which is aligned with the UK Professional Standards Framework. So that's that kind of safe space for um, innovators and early adopters to share their ideas with other people too. So it's definitely a kind of multi multi pronged approach. And, and again, my key messages, I think, you know, I've written them down too. key messages are learning from and with academics and multiple methods of engagement. Um, and as I said before, I don't think we could do what we do without the early adopters. Um, and another thing I think to sort of reflect on in relation to early adopters is that early adopters can see the, the potential of innovation across different disciplines. So they can, for example, get the most out of first year coordinators meetings. They can get the most out of things like the University Learning and Teaching Conference. But the people who are perhaps later, you know, we call them the early and late majority, those people who are a bit later to the game in terms of adopting innovation in their learning and teaching, they really like to see examples from their own or cognate disciplines. And so that's why, as well as the central support that we provide, we also need to help support activities within the colleges themselves um, and obviously the schools themselves. Um, you know, they, they have a, a process of sharing good practice as well. Um, so I think that's everything I wanted to say, really. I think, is that a good summary? Thanks. Thanks, Vicky. That is a great summary. There actually, there's a question in the Q&A. There are two I'd like to come back to. One is about how we engaged with the, the cleaning staff and the other one is about how we worked with colleagues who um, weren't quite the early adopters. So Vicky, I, you might want to answer the second one or start to answer the second one in the chat and I will come back um, to that as part of the Q&A because I think that's a really important question for us to pick up but I'll pass over to to Scott for just now so thank you that's great Scott thanks hello uh, let me just pull up the right screen to share here with you so it's been doing this where it starts on the blank screen for me hopefully that's coming through well now so um, yes, I am, or I'm, just, I'm probably just going to say I am the good practice advisor. I'm not anymore, but it's easier for me to not try to remember my tenses. Um, so through this project, uh, as I said at the start, my role was to collect, curate and disseminate examples of good practice in learning and teaching. So Vicky's done a great job there of, of giving you an overview of all of the different networks that, that, that work at the University of Glasgow to help do things like that. What I'll try to do here is show you maybe one example of a, a, a process that goes through that collection, curation and dissemination um, process that you, you may choose to use as a model if you're thinking of doing something similar at your own institutions. Uh, my own background is, uh, is fairly broad in terms of the experience that I have had on campus. Disciplinarily, I am a molecular bio biologist originally um, before I moved into educational development. Uh, but the, the role that I 
did before being good practice advisor involved seeing students at all of our levels from undergraduate to postgraduate taught it was in the biggest of rooms down to the smallest of tutorial uh t tutorial rooms so when the building was being proposed and we were working through all of our working groups to say this would be good this would be bad this doesn't work um, it's always good when you're standing in front of a lectern and you have one of these things to hand you know i i, I hope i brought a, a range of experiences there and so if you're thinking about designing your own teams to do similar things uh, i think that's that's one thing to look for uh, in the in the people that you invite into those to those conversations um and the the collection curation and dissemination phases of this process for me i think looked like this there were at the start visits to other universities not all of us were lucky enough to get the international tickets to go to places like australia where <laughs> i think moira and nicola um, got the luxury of flying to, to sea uh, there were things published in the literature you've heard nick and vicky talk about these things already um, so we took what was out there and started to translate it into uh, finding examples also of these things in the institution. Uh, we had showcases for staff, so Vicky's just been talking about those types of things, workshops to generate ideas because the value often comes from when people hear about these things from their colleagues rather than necessarily from us standing you know, at the front saying this would be a good idea for you. Um, and it was really trying to get people to buy into the idea of changing their teaching. So I think one of the things that Karen could probably emphasize later is the importance of saying, if you were going to use one of these rooms, then you really need to think about making a major investment in redesigning your teaching so that you're not shoehorning your old class designs into one of these spaces, but you're rethinking what can this class offer so that when I bring the students in, I'm maximizing everybody's value for the time that they're spending in there. Um, and after the collection phase, row two here is about curation. So we, and some of this, some of this has been done and some of it was not able to be done because of the pandemic. And also some of it has been done after I left the role of good practice advisor, but we had uh, plans to do things like match up people who were working on similar projects so that they could then take their pilots forward together and learn from each other and ultimately develop some internal case studies. Vicky mentioned the early adopters, the room was open for the summer that we've just, sorry, the building was open for the summer that we've just had. So there was a, a chance there to catch people doing things in what would be the third semester of uh, master's programs there before the new semester started in, in September for us. So we could use those to catch people and say what worked for you, what didn't work for you. Um, and then disseminate these directly with targeted uh, staff. So people that we know have classes that we think are useful for these rooms. So for example, our first large first year large cohorts, some of our degrees have around 700 students on, on them. So those would be um, Maybe that's too much for the actual the, the largest lecture theatre that you've just seen but where we see that there's a value for the class we can go directly to those people and say here's this room we think it would be good for you we probably pictured your class when we were designing it have you thought about using it these are these are some suggestions um heads of schools are etc etc is important in here what i found in my time being good practice advisor is that although there's notionally a head of a certain thing in a different subject area It's not always in, pr in practice the person with the job title that you expect who actually heads up disseminating information about that particular facet of learning and teaching in reality you know at, at glasgow we have around 20 different schools within our four colleges some of them have heads of school plus a head of a deputy head for learning and teaching and then there are other variations on that as well so uh so Professor Martin Kingsbury, a colleague from Imperial College London, uh, in a conversation at a bar after a conference once said that as educational developers, our tricky job is to become educational ninjas, where you not only find out the local lay of the land in different school areas, but also have to insert yourself into those conversations as a trusted member of staff before you can start to implement change. And so having conversations that, that help them identify you as, as a trusted person is an important part of all of this. And beyond all of the stuff that we can advise on paper, um, I found that was one of the most important facets of my job. And then dissemination, back bringing it full circle, 
we we are here today being one of the disseminators that are, are probably represented in uh, row one box one up there on the top row so the case studies I had hoped to develop didn't actually manage to we didn't we didn't get to that stage because my role changed and the pandemic happened and um, a few different things co combined to get in the way but one of the examples that follows a similar pattern was our approach to um, creating guidelines for socially distanced lab teaching right lab teaching has to happen in a lab and when the government says you can only have certain numbers of people in a lab uh, even if you can come into the lab at all, then it means a big rethink for the staff. So we as an institution, I'm going to change what I'm screen sharing here, um, as an institution created principles for the return to campus. Share uh, this window, please. There we go. So first of all, there's a page here which ex explains what our, oh, my focus on my camera has gone, uh, explains what our guidelines about returning to campus are and then within that there are examples of people who've managed to do it successfully through the, the previous what was at that point the previous year and in a similar way to what i was hoping we would have been able to create for the james McKean smith for our new building here are some case studies which are just interviews with the staff who've made it work so within each of these there is a video with a staff member talking about what they did, what challenges they found, and if that's your preferred mode of learning from people, then the video is there. If you would rather scan the page, then we also have a summary of what context that person was working in. So hopefully others could come along and identify something that matches their situation. So maybe you're also in that school, or maybe you're also um, uh, you, you recognise that your technological competency is of this level rather than one of the advanced ones and so maybe you want to watch this case study instead of a, a more advanced one. And then the more you realise that you might want to watch this, this case study, the more detail you can dig into. So we asked the people involved what they did, uh, what the benefits were for students and for staff, crucially both sides of that coin. We made it explicit that we were asking for both of those challenges for both of those and we got some evaluation uh, in there as well. So it was clear that this wasn't just all a good idea on paper, but these, this was the feedback that we'd had. So that's what I think of as, as my approach to the dissemination model after curating some examples from around campus. And there is another good practice advisor in post now. The post hasn't been um, deleted. I'm just doing something else with my time I'm in, in a different, different role. Uh, so that's my section finished and I think I'm now, shall I hand back to Moira or shall I go direct over? I was just going to say thank you and then hand over to Andrew and thank you for, for setting that in context Scott, I realise we've asked you to talk about previous job but you were so involved it was really helpful so thank you for that. Andrew, um, our last input around the um, support for students and then we'll come to the Q&A, thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so as I said at the start, I work in student learning development, SLD, um, and we are kind of, as Scott said, the, the flip side of the coin here to this. So uh, Nick and Vicky and Scott in this previous role were talking about how how to engage staff and how to get staff on side with, with active learning, with the new building, with everything that we're doing me and or my team and I are there to, to work directly with students um, in helping them realize all of their academic abilities and academic achievements. Um, the way in which our team is set up is we have an effective learning advisor for each of Glasgow's four colleges and then we have two uh, effective learning advisors specifically for international students. We have maths and stats advisors um, and then we have a, a really quite large team um, of about 38 uh, PhD students who work as tutors with us as well. Our goal is to try and make students um, or help students, it's probably the word, help and make students um, achieve all of the, the, the best outcomes that they can possibly have um, through thinking about pedagogy, through thinking about assessment um, and through thinking about the, the approaches and the things that they'll be doing in, in the class. So what I thought I'd talk about today for, for just a couple of minutes is some of the things that we as a team have done to try and firstly engage students with, with these changes um, and to help students adapt to and adopt those new practices um, so that kind of like what Vicky was saying that there's 
that there's this idea of things that are not now happening to students. It's not just this didactic, they come, they sit in a lecture hall, somebody talks at them for an hour and then they leave. Um, but instead that we we really embed in students this this understanding of what is happening to them, why is it happening to them, in what ways is it happening to them, and how are they active participants and collaborators in that entire process. Um, there are some challenges to that uh, for us. So, for example, um, we have a very large international cohort who come from quite radically different academic cultures and academic backgrounds where expectations can be really um, different to what, what we're asking of in, in, so Vicky mentioned, for example, this team-based learning in the Adam Smith Business School, and um, there can be challenges there in getting students on board. And one of the, one of the things that we do from our side is try and help students understand not just what it is that we're doing, but why it is. And there's that kind of justification as to why is this the thing that we're asking you to do? Why is this the, 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 the approach that we take? So we try really, really hard to engage students in these new teaching practices, practices in these new learning practices, um, and help students to then understand some of the, the processes, the tools, the abilities, and, the, and, and to be honest, the tricks of the trade um, that can kind of help them through that, that process in the, in the most meaningful way and allow students to get all the things that out of these sessions, out of these approaches, out of these pedagogies that, that we want. Um, it kind of what we're talking about here circles back to again what Vicky had mentioned around about the the new uh, learning and teaching strategy for Glasgow. So this idea of things being student centred, and um, this idea of transforming curricula and skills development. And um, what we try and do there is with the student centredness is have students at the heart of the discussion that we are having with with them around about pedagogies approaches class design and things to do and how to do it in the classroom. Um, with regards to the transformation of curricula, as that transforms things like assessment practices, as that transforms things like teaching contact hours and so on, again, we try to be there to, to help students engage with, understand um, and, and get to grips with changing assessment types, changing assessment formats, um, or in changing makes it sound, I want to, I have a more positive word than that, innovative assessment practices. I think that's that's the kind of word that we're looking for, where there can be, again, as Vicky mentioned, these kind of pushbacks sometimes of, okay, well, I'm in, I'm in fourth year of my, Scotland has a four year degree structure, I'm in fourth year of my undergraduate, every assessment I've had until now has been an essay, and now you're making me do a group presentation, uh, what, what do I do? Um, and there, there can be real student anxiety around about that. So again, for us, it's a, it's about helping them realise why we, why we are asking them to do this, and then give them the tools to do that. Um, and so, what I thought I'd kind of take us through is a couple of examples of things that we, we have done around about um, engaging with with tech, around about engaging with um, different types of, of of active participation. So, if you let me share my screen. So this first example here is um, a combined piece of work that it was an LTDF, a Learning and Teaching Development Fund project between us in Student Learning Development and the School of Psychology. Um, and we looked at how to, this was started pre-pandemic, but we looked at ways to get students to best engage with lecture recordings. Um, and how to get the most out of lecture recordings. So thinking about that shift that we were talking about earlier towards increasing use of, of lecture recording, the pandemic has fast forwarded that more than I think we would ever have anticipated would have been possible. Um, what we realized there was that from the student perspective, they were oftentimes getting um, a full semester's worth of teaching, trying to cram it down into three days of revision, two days of revision, one day of revision, half a day of revision before the exam and try to cope with with that kind of information overload and so we were very keen to try and help students with this idea of working through uh, lecture recordings working through how to to structure up their approaches to um, dealing with information especially when we lose the the traditional structure of the the one hour lecture and um, so it was about helping students kind of guide themselves through that we had 
planner examples, things about smart goals, setting smart goals, um, approaches to taking taking effective notes from recorded lectures, from, from video lectures in essence. Um, and every single student, every single undergraduate and postgraduate student at the university was enrolled onto this course um, and given information about, again, how to, how to work through this. We were also really keen, if I skip to the end, really keen to get them to think about reflecting on their processes here. So one of the things, if we're getting them to engage in, in this kind of much more active style of note taking, this much more active style of note making, one of the things we wanted to try and get them to do was reflect on what works, what hasn't worked, why did it work, why did it not work. And again, to echo Vicky, um, when she was talking about this, the the evidence base for this of proving how and where and why this works we're really keen always to do the same thing with our students so it's not just anecdotal i say this is the best way to do it because i say but here is an evidence base so we give them things around about um guidance as to as to what works why it works and, and how we know that we also okay. have for example um a variety of other information oh sorry Marta. I was quick, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was just going to plant a question. I did this to Nicola in the first session while you're talking because it might help you. You can pick up on it as you're answering. Joe has put a question in the chat about could we capture in this what the experience is for students who are studying joint programmes where they've got different disciplines. So I thought, yeah. I hope you don't mind me interrupting, but I thought no. it might help to put that in just now while you're still talking because it might yes. be pick up. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And actually, it's a, it's a really, a really good question because um, it's one of the Again, one of the, the challenges that students can face oftentimes is they, so we have, let's pick an example, we have a very broad degree structures in arts and social sciences, and we can have students that are studying across arts and social sciences, and they may have, so I'm a historian by background, so I'm going to pick on my subject, they may have very old fashioned style approaches to teaching from a, a historian, not to say that all historians are old fashioned, um, but maybe they're going to their, their, their history class and they're getting lecture plus seminar, and then they're also doing sociology where everything is flipped and everything is, is active. Um, and again, that's one of the one of the challenges students face is adapting to different teaching practices in different places. Um, and so one of the one of the things that we have done is try to again explain to students what's happening to them in different classes um, and give them the necessary tools and the necessary um, structures to try and work successfully in those different assessment types, assessment criteria. So we might have, for example, here, this is one of our middle courses. Um, where we look at things like learning independently, but we also focus on things like working in groups and presenting um, giving group or giving individual presentations. Um, and the idea behind this is that for each one, um, students are always taken through a whole variety of different workbooks. So it sits under here and um, things that they can work through, things that they can engage with. And again, everything here is, is evidence based. These tend to be split up along broad subject lines. So this is arts and social sciences. There's versions for our two science colleges, of which Scott is now one of the effective learning advisors. Um, and we also have the, the focus for international students as well. Um, and one of the things that I'll stop sharing the screen. One of the things that we are keen to do is with our international students is get them to think of themselves as being part of a, an academic community. Um, and being part of the this kind of engagement with this intercultural and um, global academic community. So we have, for example, um, this idea of engaging with an online academic community, which I'll pop in the chat. Again, what we want to do is is embed with our with our students this view that they are engaging with us um, and engaging with each other um, in discussions, in debates, um, and in, in a wider community. So that, that kind of idea of the, the question there about this multiple different uh, subject areas or multiple different approaches, that's partly what we try and instill in the students is this, this, this discussion of this academic community, which is varied and nuanced, um, and that there are academic literacies that underpin each one of those types of discussions where we can, where we can figure that out between us and the students. Um, we also have, uh, if I look at some other sources, stuff, for example, acknowledging that, that group work uh, can quite often be, any kind of group activity can quite often be 
a place where students will sigh and roll their eyes. Um, we try again here to, to justify the approach a little bit, but then also give them really quite practical tools to best navigate through what can be a challenging um, situation for, for, for our undergraduates. Outside of that, we have things like um, how to speak up in seminars. Um, this was written by one of our, our PhD students um, who herself had voiced the fact that she found it really quite difficult to teach up and in, in, speak up in, in, in seminars, speak up in, in active discussions. And so I had this kind of reflective piece on, here's what happened to me. This is how I did it. This is how it worked. Um, and then we have things like um, our active participation with our students. So this idea of getting our students to do things and giving them the, the recognition and the reward for that. So that trying but tying back into the teaching strategies focus on skills development. Um, we have, for example, the um, exceptional uh, award, which let me get a link to that. So we ran this year uh, an award program for students who submitted any kind of research piece around about COP26. So Glasgow held COP26, uh, well, last calendar year, this academic year. Um, and so we had a, a competition for students to engage actively in the publication and the dissemination of multi and inter interdisciplinary research. And again, it was the focus here is all about getting students to articulate and, exam and exemplify this kind of active participation in, again, to echo, echo what Vicky had said, this idea of being a world changing student or a world, world changer. Um, we used COP26 as, as a really strong example of how can, how can our students contribute to this world changing discussion. So going forward, um, what we are moving into doing is putting together a new portfolio of provision specifically on active learning. So looking at uh, a student explanation, a student guide to active learning, a student guide to how to succeed with active learning, what it is that it means and how, how to work on that. Um, and we also have a range of new peer um, learning uh, staff that will be joining the team very, very soon, which will look at embedding a whole bunch more of peer learning, peer assessment um, and peer support. Uh, in order to, to kind of further exemplify this active participation. So we will have things like um, uh, peer assisted learning schemes working within subject, but also peer assisted learning schemes working within, for example, some of our student accommodation. Um, and we'll, it's this idea of, again, further embedding the, the curricula and the models that Vicky was talking about and that Scott was talking about um, to, to help our students adapt um, and adopt those new practices. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I am very impressed with your ability to answer questions, drop in links and keep talking. That's uh, quite an achievement. <laughs> I, I envy you. Um, thank you, everybody. We, we have some questions. I haven't lost the there was an early question before lots of the interaction on the chat, which is great to see. Thank you for all of that um, about timetabling. So, Karen, I wondered if I could put two questions to you. One is one that I have partially answered in the chat. And that's from Suzanne about our cleaning staff and, you know, the impact on them from a number of the changes. And, you know, we did have some sessions with them where we were sharing our ideas and asking for their feedback on the pilot spaces. Um, so that, that's one area I wondered if there was anything more that you would want to say, because, you know, they really are key and we've changed a lot about how they work. And the other one is a question um, about timetabling and in what way are we I guess re changing how we do the timetabling in order to support these changes in teaching practice. So if we maybe take those two together and then I will pick up another one about the, the non-early adopters. Um, yes, yeah, so, so in terms of uh, the facilities teams, um, I, I guess there was a, a partly a coincidence that, that we went through some restructuring of those teams uh, at the same time as we were opening the, the hub. But actually, right from, from the start, when we were designing the building and thinking about how that would function, we knew we needed those people to work differently. So, so it was always a different operational model that was created as part of that. Um, and, and seeing them as part of a team that is supporting 
all aspects of the building. So whether that's a student not sure where to find a particular room or facility, uh, whether that's academic staff not sure, you know, where, where's the on button for, for the, the projector, um, or, or resetting furniture where that's appropriate and, and recognizing that we don't want to spend all our time moving the chairs so they all sit in neat rows. Uh, but sometimes stuff, you know, finds its way into different parts of the building and, and we need it back in in the, in the room so that the, we can accommodate the number of people that it's intended. So we worked really closely with them and, and because it was a, a completely new team and they were able to work in the building before we opened it to anybody, it meant they got very comfortable in and around the building. They understood how it functioned. They understood the, the kind of pinch points. Um, they, they understood the kind of flows around the building. So there's some kind of natural flows that we see. So they, they were then geared up to support that. And we operate um, a model that supports the building over its full opening hours. So traditionally in the university, you know, the, the cleaning staff, for example, are either in very early, you know, five and six o'clock in the morning um, to, to get the place ready for, for the, the standard working day, um, or they're in in the evenings, sort of starting work perhaps at five o'clock. And we recognize that in a building with the kind of flow of people, um, I mean, there, there's, there's in the region of, of 3,000 seats in the building of, of one kind or another. Um, so you're likely to be ha having many thousands of people moving through the building over the course of a day, a, a cleaning and management regime that is just two hours before anybody arrives and maybe two hours after they've all gone was just not going to, to meet the need. Um, so it, it, it did require, just as we had to rethink teaching and rethink the kind of space that we were creating, we had to rethink the operational model as well. And that was really important. Um, on the timetabling piece, uh, yes, timetabling is always the tricky one. <laughs> I think what was hugely helpful um, was that, that we did identify these early adopters, people that were already looking to transform their teaching and were really waiting for the, the space opportunity to catch up with their aspirations and with what they were already trying to do in um, what we might kindly describe as suboptimal locations. Um, but but having them knowing who therefore was was likely to be working out of that building using that building for their teaching meant that we could work with them at a really detailed level on their timetable on how that is structured so what are the group sizes uh, what do we how do we describe those activities so students have a sense of of what they're going to engage in and also when does that teaching happen because um you know that there are there's only 22 teaching rooms in the building so not everybody could get in and not everybody can get in at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday which always seems to be the most popular time in the week um, and therefore what opportunities were there to shift things to so people taught at different times or indeed in different ways so you know we've got some people moving away from a structure where they would have um, quite a large cohort uh, meeting in, in, in two lecture sessions a week, but then that cohort split into 10 or 12 smaller seminar groups um, who would meet you know, at, at separate 10 or 12 hour slots um, to, to a structure where they've, they've put the, the lecture and the seminar together. So they have a two hour block of time, called it something different. Um, and they've just split the whole cohort into, into two groups and they meet as a whole. So that, that's in the region of 250 students meeting together in one of the really large rooms um, to do something that is much more interactive, is probably requiring them to have done some pre-work, but enabling them to have a really good chunk of time to engage with the material. But that in itself can't just happen uh, on a whim or overnight, it, we really had to work quite hard to find the slots that would work around the choice that students have in their timetable. Um, but, but having the early adopters, having those volunteers was, was enabled us to do that. Thanks, Karen. And that's helpfully taken us into the um, early adopters question a little bit more actually. And, and Vicky and Nick may want to come into the, in on this. 
just to, to answer directly Hannah's question about early adopters, I mean, we don't, we don't have these spaces across the entire campus. So by working with those who are engaged and who want to do this work or where a school has a, a clear strategy for, for doing this kind of work, we're focusing our energy there and there are other spaces for, for others to use. As Karen has said, they're not always quite what we would like, but, but, they, but that, that allows that kind of balance. And we're just trying to, to, to gently, through the learning and teaching strategy, help people rethink the curriculum and make those gentle incremental steps to change. I think there's a, a point in the chat about people's workload and time and availability. And, you know, unless we work with colleagues in light of their workload and um, from, in light of their confidence and their um their confidence and their competence to build up those skills to do things at a pace that works for them will we'll really not have that level of engagement but, but Vicky talked before about um, the importance of hearing success stories from someone who teaches in your discipline and I think that's also really important that where we have early adopters whatever academic discipline they're teaching and they will be in a sense some of the best advocates to their colleagues who are perhaps more nervous or apprehensive or circumspect about the value of some of this, they will be the best advocates. And of course, the students are hugely important here. You know, they they will they give us, uh, Lauren talked in the earlier session about the, the representative structure, you know, they're embedded in talking to us about their experience, what they find effective to help their learning. So what we try to do is to build on all of those conversations and support people to change in a way that that they they can engage with constructively rather than forcing something. Um, on them when they're they're not ready. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers it adequately, Hannah. But that that's kind of the approach that we take. But Vicky and Nick, Vicky, you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I was just going to say you've used a phrase before, Moira, and I think it, it's really appropriate. It's meeting people where they are. So it's not about throwing people in at the deep end. So for example, if you had a, a new member of staff and they weren't particularly confident in terms of active learning, you wouldn't suddenly put them into one of the big rooms with about eight to, to 12 tables round so that the, the, this is completely kind of unfamiliar to them. It's about scaffolding that process and it's about enabling people to try things out in a low risk fashion. Um, so for example, you know, let's get started in some of the smaller rooms or use some of the existing teal spaces on campus and then reflect on that, that practice within the context of the PG cap um, itself, the emphasis is on creating a safe learning environment for our staff because that's what we want them to do for our students is create a safe space where um, students feel able to participate and contribute and so I think we want to do the same. Um, it's not about throwing them in at the deep end and sometimes it's even just small changes to practice. So it could be something like a teaching observation and somebody's delivered a very teacher centred um, session so we would work with them individually to think are there ways to make your teaching more participative you know what techniques even something as basic as think pair share could you bring that in to give students a chance to, to contribute so it's starting in small ways rather than than a complete transformation for people who aren't ready and let's not forget that this is ongoing this will always be ongoing there is no point where you say, that's great, we've done it. Everybody does active learning. Well, no, it's not happening. I mean, it is interesting to see the shift throughout the years. I mean, I've been in this job for over 20 years. So I've been dealing with PG Cups, with you know, the, the whole environment. It was learning technologies at a point where there wasn't even a name for learning technologies. So it was a long time ago. And it's fascinating because of all the work that we have been doing over all these many years in all universities, I would say, certainly in, in Britain, but I suppose also in the world, in Europe, and things like the PG Cup, where the new lecturers come in and they really start reflecting and learning and, and, and changing things. How the bulk, if, for lack for a better word, of staff is actually more and more towards active approaches, quite simply because it just eventually changed, eventually comes through. I mean, I remember 15 years ago, technology wasn't ubiquitous and it kind of feels like yesterday or, or sometimes it feels like a very long, long time ago. But I, I think a lot has changed happened in the last, can you imagine if the pandemic had happened 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, we would have had so many more problems. So really it is a continuous program of, 
working together, partnerships, learning, changing, transformation, and also who knows what's going to happen in another 10 years um, if the world's still standing. Um, so um, this whole idea you mentioned in the, in the previous session, hybrid learning and teaching, I don't know. I, I frankly have no idea if there ever will be some sort of technology, like Star Trek-wise, or I don't know, I don't, what term, uh, that really enables hybrid teaching and learning. I don't know. Maybe there will be. Maybe there won't be. And I think the openness and the and the willingness to take in and change and transform continuously. I think that's just important and exciting in higher education. Thanks, Mike. Scott. You want to comment on that one? Yeah, I just had something to say, springboarding off of uh, Vicky's comments and yours about meeting people where they are. Uh, one thing I've noticed. I think it's to do with one thing I've noticed in the past couple of weeks, which I think is to do with our internal administrative cycles every year, is that people have been contacting me to find out where they can find the videos where they were shown talking about how they innovated in some way and found a, a positive impact for their students. So another targeting option, if you're thinking about trying to influence change is clearly to get the people who want to be able to show off later that they've done something, probably because it's going to make a, a good addition to their promotion applications or their publication portfolio. And uh, and then maybe that's a way of identifying people that can be early adopters rather than waiting for the early adopters to just be the first people to come to your door. And uh, or, or the other element of it might be, um, it occurred to me that we've got all of these people with that lab a case study bank that I showed who have identified successes and then those successes can be the starters for other conversations with people who I could you know go along to and say so, so what's the biggest challenge that you face in your subject area right now oh that's interesting because this person found a really excellent solution to that so have you thought about doing that actually one when, when that's just prompted me to uh, to to pick up on something that Vicky mentioned before so so Vicky and her input and, and Scott just there talking about seeing people's impact reminded me to to clarify we have a we have a scheme that Vicky mentioned called LTDF learning teaching development fund and Andrew referred to that too um it's it's a it's a fund that's there to to stimulate and support innovations in learning and teaching and assessment and we have expanded elements of that and, and this year we've launched some student staff partnership schemes that we've trialed before, but we're doing them on a much larger scale. But it, I think just to put this into context, very often it's relatively small awards in terms of financial awards that people need just to, to employ an intern, for example, for a few weeks to help with an evaluation or to gather data from students or from colleagues. And I think that makes a big difference. It just, you know, in a way it goes back to the workload question that somebody mentioned before, it just gives people a little bit of resource to help evaluate their practice or to bring someone in to, to support them to do something that they want to do, but they might just be struggling for time. But the totality of that helps us to build up an evidence base for you know, what things have worked and actually what things haven't worked. And I think we've tried to be open with you today that, that you know, we're not finished the job here and there are some things that, that we haven't got answers to yet that we would like to have answers to. And I dare say there will be things that we've tried that we wouldn't do again. And certainly from the pilot rooms, there are, there are setups for the audiovisual and technology that we, we tried, but we wouldn't do again. So you know, really making sure that we incorporate that into our evidence base um, is important, but it doesn't always take large quantities of money. It can be done quite effectively by just some relatively small funds for colleagues to, to support them. Um, so I thought that might be something to just to share with people. Um, I'm, I'm aware that there's a question about learning hour, uh, contact hours. So Hans has asked, um, do we see a lessening of the number of contact hours? So fewer lectures, but more effective working group hours in combination with asynchronous preparing. Um, again, I, I'm very happy for others to come in on this. I, I think that that will happen, but I think the question for me is, what's the educational design behind that? I think that, you know, there's a, there's been a tendency, I think, during the pandemic for, for the narrative across the sector and not necessarily from universities to be about, you know, online is bad and it's not such good quality or such good value. And I think people are, are trying to rethink their teaching whilst articulating where is asynchronous, where are asynchronous learning materials that students can work through independently, actually a really good, important part of a learning experience alongside 
face-to-face -face interactive sessions and so the way we've been trying to think about it and and, and we, we have to sort of do it at the moment slightly differently each year depending on where we are with the pandemic is to say to, to colleagues think about what is the best use of time when you have students with you in person what is it you really want to spend that time doing and then how do you scaffold around about that in ways that allow the students to achieve their learning outcomes and you know can a little shift in the emphasis for between kind of the larger group lectures to sort of so large but smaller group seminars could that make a big difference supported by an asynchronous learning materials and trying to shift the conversation from being about teaching or contact hours which we often think of from the point of view of the teacher to learning hours on this course if we think that there's a hundred hours of learning how how do we expect students to manage that hundred hours of their time including their assessment and then what does that mean for how we structure the the teaching sessions and the use and access of resources and I would say some of the feedback we had during the pandemic was that staff were trying so hard to give students lots of support that actually it was too much support and they didn't quite know how to manage all of that material so the sessions that, that Andrew described are so important there but but we have to be very clear with students you know what is a reasonable amount of asynchronous um, material or or you know, for them to work through and, and how do we use that effectively in the class so that we we think through that process from their perspective um i don't know whether others want to say anything more about that i just if when i think the way to do i agree entirely and i think the way or an important element to that is then also helping our students understand when when they when things are asynchronous so there's a justification for things to be asynchronous and that 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 there are approaches to be able to deal with that when things are synchronous um, again there's a justification for that to be synchronous and to give students the the tools the abilities the hints and tips even of how to how to engage most successfully with that um, and i think it, it kind of to echo what you were saying that more of that I, the kind of negative discussion in the media around about what what we had been doing i think is, is really well i'm biased but i think it's really unfair and really harsh um, but i think that the the student perspective of that hasn't always been as negative as the press has have been portraying. Um, but I think that the, the, the crucial element, one of the things again that we've really tried, we've tried really, really hard to do is explain to students and engage students in the discussion as to what it is we are doing at different points, how we're doing that and why we're doing that. So it goes back to that whole kind of partnership thing of saying, OK, if we're doing X, Y and Z, here are the reasons why we're doing that. Um, and here's the approaches that you might take in order to get to get the most out of that. And I think from from my team's perspective, I think that's the success bit for us. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. Nick? Just, just to add to what Andrew said, he's so right. And, and I think just so that students understand why they're doing something. Um, I've heard students many times say, oh, they're making us do this group work again. I don't like group work without ever having been told why they might be doing group work. Um, and any kind of learning activity needs with it an understanding of why they're actually doing it, what might be the outcomes, and linking it all back to um, the ILOs, to the assessment at the end. To, I mean, the, the good old alignment. And it's so important that students know and understand. I mean, after all, would anybody want to do something that, that they have no idea why they're doing it just for the sake of doing? So. Absolutely what Andrew said, yes, from a staff point of view as well, because we need to support that. Thanks, Nick. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through, and I think we've picked up on the questions in the chat, but if any of my colleagues have spotted anything that I've missed, please let me know. Um, I just wanted to explain, I've popped in a, a link to a video on YouTube um, from colleagues um, at Nanyang Technological University. One of the things that we've not talked about hugely at the moment is um, team teaching. And we've talked a lot about team-based learning, but actually a lot of our new spaces give us the opportunity to do more kind of interdisciplinary team teaching. Um, and so I put that video link in because in the video, um, Prem and Rajalingam, who's been leading a lot of the work there, talks about the ways in which the medical school have brought different disciplines together to teach in a room together a, a large scale version of one of the um, images that Vicky shared as a scale up type room 
So I just thought that might be of interest to some of you to take a look at what they've been doing. Um, Preman spoke at one of our learning and teaching conferences about his experience and it's really interesting to hear um, just how they've developed that and how they've supported their own colleagues. So again, I would, if that's of interest to you, I would commend um, them and Preman's very open to sharing his experience too. So you might, might want to follow that up with him. Um, I think if there, oh, Joe's just popped another question. It'd be interesting to see how learning expectations morph. You see differences or patterns between different disciplines and parts of the university. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm not sure if you mean student expectations here, Joe, or if you're meaning um, staff expectations, maybe we can say a little bit about both. I don't know if we're seeing a pattern that relates to disciplines as such. I think maybe the pattern relates to the size of the cohort. So what we're seeing is where, where people have large cohorts of students, they're thinking about how they can change their practices. That's typically more to do with undergraduate programmes where they're, they're much larger groups of students. Um, and I would say that the, the disciplines where there's a disciplinary dimension, um, perhaps those who have lab teaching are also thinking differently about what's the, what's the balance between that lab teaching, small group teaching that's not a lab based activity and those larger typically larger lecture type activities and they're currently in the process of rethinking they might keep their lecture slot in the timetable <laughs> for reasons Karen has explained it's not always easy to move because it could clash but they might keep that slot but do something differently in there so I think the experience of the last couple of years is, is getting everybody to think but particularly those who have those larger cohorts for whom it's been traditionally harder to do something other than a a typical lecture, if you like. And I think I would also just say, we're not saying a lecture is a bad thing and I think that's important. You know, a well-designed lecture is really good experience and we designed the lecture theatre for a reason, <laughs> but it's it's about how we structure that and how we engage and how we get students to, to engage actively. So it's not that we're saying no big groups, but we are seeing people think differently about how they engage with those larger groups in those settings. I would add to that, that working you know, across the institution and across all disciplines. Of course, I do see some differences, but I think that also comes in part from the tradition of the discipline. You know, we have disciplines that have like 500 years of a certain tradition. Um, so, of course, that will influence that. Um, I think it is everything from a staff point of view that Moira mentioned, plus um, history, I think. Mm -hmm as in the tradition and the history of uh, how somebody might be working with it. If you're used to small tutorial groups, is, is that what you did used to do 100 years ago, then that is something that uh, you might want to move, go for nowadays. So there are different approaches really in the disciplines that I see to some of these active learning things. And if you're just used to, to, to uh, lectures because you used to just write on a big blackboard, for an hour, then you might have a different approach. And I'm not saying that it's not acceptable to write on a big blackboard for an hour because I have been taught to understand that sometimes that's actually really necessary. Yeah, for, for illustrating things. I was going to bring would... in Andrew. Oh, sorry. I was going to bring Andrew in a second and someone put his hand up. But Karen, you, you go first and I'll come to Andrew because I think the students' expectations are changing and we need to, to really align them. But Karen, yes. <clears throat> and it was the student. Uh, aspect I wanted to pick up on. I think what we're seeing is um, th their behavior is changing, so how they want to engage in study. So, I mean, partly the, the opportunity that we've created with um, the Journey to Kieran Smith, but actually the way that is then um, being adopted in other teaching spaces. So what we are seeing is students coming together to study. So it's almost like a kind of social study. Um, and whether that is a number of students just working alongside each other, all on different things, but they want to be together in a space, or they are actually working together on the same thing, you know, whether it's projects, coming together to watch their online uh, video content and things like that. There's this real sort of social, um, need it, it appears and we're seeing an awful lot of that and I think that's quite important for us to both recognize and understand what what role that will continue to play 
Um, I mean, it, you know, it may have been a feature of the pandemic and the fact that there was there was not a lot of face to face teaching or in person teaching going on, and that that kind of social contact need that we all have at the the base of our humanity. Um, or it might just be a new way that students wish to engage in learning and learn together. And that obviously has implications for our space, but it has implications perhaps for the, the kind of activities that we might set as part of that learning curriculum. Thanks, Karen. That sounds like a great place for Andrew to pick up from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. I think there are two kind of points off from that. I think the first one is, as Karen was talking about, this idea of the places um, and and the spaces and one of the things that we see when we're when we're talking with students now is that they as Karen says they want to do things in groups much much more than we would have ever so I've been working in in this job for for a decade now um, and even in that decade things have changed really substantially from students wanting to come in have one to one appointments with us have one to one discussions to now wanting to come in and do things in in groups um, and and stay in those groups um, and i think it was nicola this morning was talking about this or lauren was talking about this idea of the sticky campus and um, i think some of the 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 things that we've seen through the the pandemic and the impacts of the pandemic are that we as an institution i think have a responsibility in a in a duty to provide that space for students to be able to to do things and work together in a way that maybe before the pandemic we I think we were starting to realize and um, but the pandemic really really pushed forward uh, at least in I think in our in my team's thinking around about this sense of community mm -hmm. student engagement um, and student student collaboration and that, that we have to we have to help that and um, whereas I think pre-pandemic quite a lot of the time we just assumed that it happened or, or let it happen and um, but now it's much more much more built in um, and the second point was off of what um off of what nick was saying around about this idea of the the kind of the leadership of of change or the implementation of change i think a lot of the times can come from the students um, and the patterns that we see i think from the students tends to be that there is something cool and exciting that happens in subject x the students talk about what's happening in subject x to students in subject y students in subject y then start talking about the thing that's happened in subject x and there's this kind of groundswell i guess um of of sharing of good practice via the student voice so i can the example that always sticks out to me here is there is in our business school and um, there are some really 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 brilliant courses and um, that engage with um the private sector that engage with industry that get students working in groups doing group group presentations my team are brought in to help along with that to help them kind of build up a portfolio of, of provision and a portfolio of, of presentations to businesses and the students love it and they get so much out of it it's it's a genuine challenge they are really challenged but they love it um, and then some of them are also studying subjects in for example economic and social history uh, and so economic and social history have kind of adopted a similar type of thing just from this spreading of news amongst the students and i think to go back to the the earlier comment around about how do you get those later ish adopters to me that's one of the really nice easy ways of get students to say professor x does this can we do that because it's so cool and it's brilliant and i loved it the, the easiest win. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, Joe, I think you asked us a question that we can't really do justice to, can we? It's It's got so many dimensions to it, but thank you for asking it, because I think it's it's the right place to, to land here at the end of the seminar. We This whole project's been about designing for the future, and as Nick has said, but it's keeping on changing, and we have to be able to adapt. And, um, you know, your question has illustrated absolutely why we need to do that and um, the students are so key in helping us think about that um, so it was a it was a great question to finish on i'm aware that it's almost half past so i think i'll um, hand over to ivana in a moment um, but just to say thank you very much to everybody for um, spending almost the whole day with us and uh, for all your questions and for all the very positive feedback that you've given us We've been so pleased to be able to share our experience and I, I very much hope it's been useful to you all. Um, so now I will pass to back to the Guild. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I can only say a big thanks from uh, the Guild to all the speakers, to you, Moira, uh, for hosting this seminar. I think not only your contributions, but only your willingness to share was really appreciated by, by all the participants. We've had more than 80 participants join the seminar throughout the day, so thank you very much. From our side, I can only say that the aim was with the insight paper and the discussions that we've started uh, a year ago, uh, the aim was not just to have this, these discussions within our member universities, but really to go beyond to the wider sector. And that's why these discussions and this seminar today is important. I can only say thank you once again and invite you all to our closing event of the Guild Seminar Series in Tübingen in June. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Goodbye.